Okay, hello folks, uh, good morning and welcome to uh, Gatwick Aviation Museum, uh, literally right next door to Gatwick. You're going to hear jets going out and coming in uh, throughout the show, um, but uh, we're going to kick the show off uh, with two of these live exhibits that they have down here uh, at the Gatwick Aviation Museum. We'll, we'll have a little look through the museum a little bit later on, but um, hit with me here I have Milton who's an engineer on this beautiful English electric lightning, um, beautifully restored Milton, and thank you. We're gonna run past, we're gonna uh, uh, have a run through the aircraft now, uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Milton, basically. So Milton, thanks very much for uh, taking your time out to, because uh, I know you're just about to wheel her out, aren't you? Uh, fairly short, yeah, we're just waiting for a, a little bit of a break in the weather, and then we're gonna wheel the airplane outside and uh, park it up so everyone can have a look at it. Okay, so there's a lot of history around this aircraft. You literally got it, uh, as uh, Peter described to me yesterday, uh, in an, like an airfix kit. Absolutely, that's probably the right way to, to describe it, really. Um, we'll maybe go to the history of the airplane a little bit in a bit, but um, we bought it in 2000, uh, very early 2000, uh, from a scrapyard in uh, Portsmouth. Yeah, and uh, it arrived as you say in sort of an airfix kit in a bit of a state because um, it had had a bit of a checkered history up to that point, and it was just going to be a static aeroplane. And then we surveyed it front to back, and despite it looking pretty hideous, it, we actually realised it was good enough to probably do an overhaul on it and turn it back into a runner. So, so it literally yeah. came in crates in pieces, uh, yeah, segments, so, so to speak. It, it, the nose came separately, the rear fuselage came in one piece, the wings were split in two, the fin, uh, the tanks, it all came in kit form basically uh, on two low loader lorries and then all the internals of the aircraft came in stillages. Uh, I think we had something like 15 stillages full of parts. I guess in total there probably was something like 10,000, 15,000 parts in stillages. Um, and then we surveyed the aeroplane and decided that we would um, restore it uh, and get it back into running condition. We had two new engines for it, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so we got started in earnest properly in about 2001. Um, and I think it took us about 15 years to rebuild it uh, to, to its current state. So. Yeah. And uh, we were just looking, uh, you, you, have a, you have a board around here which is, uh, basically describes uh, a, little about, uh, a little bit about the build history of it. Um, and uh, one of the pictures there was, uh, was, the, was the wiring loom, oh, yes. uh, which yes. must have been uh, an absolute nightmare. I, you just told me that you and, you and Dave rewired the whole aircraft. Yeah, so it's myself and Dave Tiley, perhaps we're going to have a chat with Dave Tiley in a bit, um, who basically cracked on with the aeroplane. Um, I don't know if you can zoom in here, but uh, this was shortly after we put it together, so we bolted the nose and the wings on, you can see the leading edges are missing. But what happened is when they, the aeroplanes were, were sold off, um, a film company uh, leased a few of the aeroplanes to film, uh, do a film called Wing Commander, a pretty atrocious space movie back from the early 90s. Um, there's a transport brake here, uh, and you have to cut all the wiring between the rear fuselage and the front fuselage, and then when you put it back together, you have to crimp them all back together. But when the film company rented the nose, all the wiring ducts that were hanging out here, what they did is they angled, angled ground all the wiring looms off. So when it arrived here, it's hard to tell in the photo, but you can see there's no wiring in here at all. Wow. And I don't know, I can't even remember off the top of my head, there was something like 1,200 circuits that weren't connected. So we had to basically withdraw all the wiring that was there in the nose, and as you can see, all hanging out the side. Uh, and then we had to go through and identify every single wire. Now, unfortunately, all the identity tags uh, had gone with the six-foot section that had been cut out. So that took us probably three and a half years to rewire the aeroplane front to back. And wow. That, that meant going to each individual surface front and back. So whether it be a flap indicator in the cockpit, the flap indicator had to come out. We had to find out where the wires were in this bunch. Then you had to find the other end. Then we had to put in new wiring and join it up. So. Yeah, it was a pretty awful process. But so, 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 even though it's not a flying exhibit, uh, you've, you've, you've rewired it back to almost as if it was a flying aircraft? Yeah, I mean, we decided early on uh, that it was such a nice aeroplane and it still had a lot of hours left on it and a lot of fatigue index life left on it, but if we were going to rebuild it, um, rather than throw it back together, which is not really in our nature, um, anything, any work we do on airframes down here, we treat them as if they were still flying, so, yeah. Um, 
pretty much everything on it, bar a few bits and pieces. It wouldn't take much to get it flying again. That's incredible. Um, I, uh, I was speaking with Peter yesterday when, when I came down here and did, did, did the recce. Some of the, some of the notable things are uh, how skinny the tyres are. Yeah. And apparently they, uh, they were only good for a couple of landings, was that right? Depended on the crosswind component on the runway. Um, so you could probably get anywhere up to six to eight landings out of, on, on these if you were... Uh, if you didn't have a crosswind component, but yeah, Peter's right. On average, somewhere like Binbrook, um, this aeroplane crosses the threshold at 175 knots, so it's a controlled crash rather than the landing, really. Wow. Um, if you had a, a, any more than about probably 8 to 10, 10 knots crosswind, then you'd probably only get two landings out of a pair of tyres. And, they're, and, they're, and the, the PSI in them is something crazy, isn't it? 365 PSI. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just insane. Yeah. And the big bulge underneath her, um, that's, that's the fuel tank, is it? Or Yeah, so what you've got is, uh, this is a 600 gallon venting tank, this is what we call ferry pack. It's got 600 gallons of fuel in it, and that extends all the way back to here. It's all fuel. All the way back up to the fuel. Wow. So why why there and not in the wings? Or is it just uh, just extra capacity? I mean, you, the wings have got three thousand two hundred pounds each in them. Um, and then the early lightnings that didn't have these big packs. Uh, you were lucky if you got probably thirty minutes flying time out of them. On one of these, by the time they started introducing flight refueling, you could probably get a loiter time of about probably anywhere between an hour and an hour and ten minutes. Um, but that would be with this ferry pack on. This behind you here is the gun pack version of that. So that is basically one of these tanks, but uh, it's fuel. This is all fuel, and then it's fuel up to here, but you've got two guns in here as well. Wow. Two 30 millimetre aid and sit in there. Nice. And the Americans always find that amusing because they say only the Brits would put guns in the fuel tanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Same capacity. Yes. You see that it's a wider tank. Yes. Uh, this one's being restored at the moment to go on the aeroplane, so we can we can swap about the fits. You're going to put a couple of uh, 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 barrels in there just to yeah. mimic it, or? Yeah. Well, this is a 30 millimeter Aiden, so this is the. Wow. Oh, that's not correct, but this is the correct gun for this tank. So we have two of those which will go in. These are deactivated, obviously. Yes. Yes. Um, That'll do some damage. Serious damage. Um, scratch it off the top of my head. I think they're about 900 rounds a minute, but I could be wrong with that. Um, uh, yeah, they do a serious amount of damage. You could probably you could take apart the house with, with those guns, no problem yeah. at all. So I noticed you got the. Uh, is that uh, Saudi? That's the Royal Saudi Air Force logo. Is so that is, is is that its origin? Was it has it come from? Yeah, so that kind of leads neatly onto the aircraft's history. So uh, this aircraft was built in 1968 at BAE Wharton and Salisbury in Lancashire. Uh, and some of the bits of the aircraft were done in Filton in Bristol, and they were all brought together to be put together at Wharton in Lancashire. Um, there was a contract called the Magic Carpet Contract, which was a contract to supply the Royal Saudi Air Force and the Kuwaiti Air Force with uh, lightnings, English electric lightnings. This was one of those to the Saudi Air Force, which was exported in '68 um, to Saudi. Uh, and then, cut a long story short, it then spent between '68 and '86 in the Royal Saudi Air Force. Um, so it was never an Air Force, a Royal Air Force aircraft, apart from when it was ferried out and ferried back. So. We decided uh, to put the aeroplane back in its correct markings um, because it, it never was a Royal Air Force aeroplane. Did you ever see any combat? Uh, yes. Uh, funnily enough, uh, lightnings, the only lightnings that ever saw combat were Royal Saudi Air Force lightnings during the uh, Yemeni incursions um, <coughs> in the early 70s, excuse me. Uh, and they were the only lightnings that actually fired, you know, fired in anger. Uh, and I believe this one took part in those incursions, or, or those uh, operations to stop the incursions into Yemen. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Um, that isn't to say that the aeroplanes weren't effective. The fact that they didn't ever fire a shot in anger in, in England is, is testament to how effective it was as a deterrent yeah. during the Cold War. I understand um, that this thing can outclimb a uh, Eurofighter, only, only briefly, but... Uh, 
50,000 uh, feet, feet per minute, or is it? Or? No, not, not really. That's, that's a misnomer. The, the, is it? The Eurofighter has, has got superior performance to this. Very of course, similar, yeah, yeah. But it's a very, very different aeroplane, so you can't really compare them. But this was about 35,000 feet per minute. Wow, OK, so slightly more than 38,000, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's not a lot to choose between them. The Eurofighter would be far more manoeuvrable than of this. Of course, yes. Um, because it's a practically a delta wing. But considering this is three generations earlier, it's quite impressive, isn't it? Indeed, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, a lot of people will go, will, will look at the back end of the aircraft in a little bit, but you've got two engines in this aircraft, which is really impressive, especially is the fact that they're on top of each other. They are, yeah. It's unique in that, in, in that uh, respect, the Lightning, that one engine was stacked on top of the other, um, which is why when you look at down the front, it's got such a narrow cross-section, which yeah. meant it had very low drag, which is why it was so slippery and so quick. Um, yeah, quite, quite unusual. So the air intake, where basically uh, it, it relies on uh, being able to breathe, um, sure. is, uh, and, and to this is the front end of the aircraft, and of course, yeah. this is this is the bullet, I believe. It's this is the radar bullet. So up yeah. there, you've got uh, an AA23 radar. Um, you can see through that. You can see a dish. It's got a small dish in there, and the whole radar. So there's the bullet over there. Yeah. So that's what that is. If you took that out of the aeroplane, that's what it would look like. And, and inside there, you've got the whole radar system. Um, yeah. And obviously, as your intake, this is just a blank. And I believe that the, um, the, 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 in order for the engine to perform during supersonic flight, mm -hmm. the air has to be a, a bit like they have to control the airflow, like the Concorde's um, ducts, that they basically redirected the air and controlled the airflow. Yeah. They kind of did the same with this? Correct, yeah. What you've got in there is what they call bifurcated duct. So with any jet engine, you can't feed it supersonic air. Um, you have to slow the air down to below supersonic before you feed it into the compressor. Um, that's, the one, that's the reason the bullet is shaped like that. It's got a um, convergent divergent intake in it, so the intake gets bigger as you go down in order uh, to open back up again to feed air into the engine. So it's probably all a bit too complicated um, for this chat. Yeah. But also interesting is that somebody is going in there. How they're going to squeeze in through that gap, I do not know. But someone's going in there to, to, to check for FOD, I believe, before right. the engine fires up. Yeah, it would either be myself or another chap called Ash. How are you going to squeeze in there? Uh, there's an art to it. Um, <laughs> breathe in. To, well, no, if you breathe in, you get stuck because oh. your lungs get bigger. <laughs> yes, so you have right. To, you have to purge all the air out of your lungs uh, and then hope that you can hold your breath long enough to squeeze past the, uh, the narrow bit. There's an art to it, and you get practised with it. It's not so bad. And once you're in there, you actually can... It's, it's big enough to almost stand up in there? Uh, not... Uh, yeah. It, it, Crouch. You can stand up as you go up towards the number two engine, but yeah, right, there's right. enough room to, to check and do what you've got to do. Yeah. Wow, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So as we move on to the... Uh, I believe also the um, the starter the, the starting procedure is uh, is quite complex in terms of the uh, in terms of you use a, a specific uh, um, material to to yeah it uses a monofuel so on the front of each engine uh, it's got uh, an impulse turbine little starter which is about yay big um, that's fed by a monofuel so. But for those that don't know what a monofuel is, is a fuel that generates its own oxygen when it burns. Uh, the advantage of that is the, when these were on what they call Q or QRA, uh, quick reaction alert, is you want to be able to start both engines on it and have it out of the hangar or the QRA shed and up to 35,000 feet intercepting a Russian bear in about three to four minutes. So by having a rapid start system, what would happen is uh, you'd feed fuel into these two impulse turbines on the front of the engine and they're, uh, they're geared and attached to the engine. So it spools the engine up, get the engine up to a certain minimum RPM, and then you feed fuel into the engine at the start. So, Are you using that system today? Yes, it's, that's the standard system on the aeroplane. Um, we've got no intentions of changing it. We don't believe in, in, in going away from the design of the, of the aeroplane. Um, there's a good reason why it was done, so we've left it alone. Excellent. So. You have a, um, an, 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 another front end here, we do, uh, yeah. or top front end, yeah. uh, which we can just have a, a look inside the cockpit sure. um, and yeah. see what the sort of starting sequences are that, if you can run us through that, okay. that would be great. Yeah. Well, Shall that, I... That's the man that owns it, stood there. Okay, okay, so if we, <laughs> if we, if we 
Right, OK, because uh, I've got the mic on you. That's fine, um, I, can, I can walk, walk okay, through. OK, that's yeah. cool. OK, so this is Dave's I'll actual front end. This side. You go that side yeah. and I'll... I'll um... <coughs> OK, so obviously we're missing the seat here. But... Well, this is under restoration. OK. Um, Dave will tell you about that, I guess, in a bit. Yes. Um, hence why it's missing its seat. This is the gun for the seat. Um, you can see that all the back end here is, is currently under restoration. Yes, yes. Uh, this is also a Saudi cockpit. This was the last Lightning to be built, actually, 53700. And this one, uh, this also went to the movie uh, company, did it? Or um, it survived or something, I, I think? Dave, did, did this one go to uh, Pinewood? I don't think it did, did it? No, out to Luxembourg. Out to Luxembourg, okay. yeah. Okay. Right, interesting. Okay, so basically, um, are you able to sort of like take us through the, uh, the starter sequences with the... Uh... Uh, well, I won't give you the exact start sequence, but right. I'll, I'll tell you roughly what it is. So you're going to be on board the, uh, on the flight deck, uh, on the, uh, in the cockpit today? Possibly, myself okay. or Dave. We okay. haven't decided that yet because right. we've got to crew both aeroplanes, so... I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, okay, uh, I mean, the basics are obviously you've got your stick, controls, these are your throttles down here, mm -hmm. uh, number one and number two throttles. This is your radar hand controller, so you know we spoke about the radar on the front. This controls that radar, um, your, your range, your azimuth, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this is this normally have a boot on it, this is the radar display. Uh, this will be lit up, so you've got your graphical representation of what the radar is doing, you know, target acquisition, all that sort of thing. And then you've got your main flight instruments here. Uh, so this is your artificial horizon, this is your direction indicator, which is a like a glorified compass really. Um, these are all your radar and instrument landing system, ILS controls. Um, and then along over here are all your main engine instruments. So these are fuel, critical on a lightning, so uh, you know, depending on where your loud levers are, uh, will depends on what range you get out the aeroplane. So main tanks and the ventral tank we discussed. These are your two RPM gauges, or percentage as we call them, uh, and this is your jet pipe temperatures. And these are your position of your petals on your afterburn pipes, which I'll show you in a bit. So these are your critical main instruments for, for your engines. So the, the, the lower ones, the jet pipe temperatures, yeah. is that literally the, the out? The... That's the temperature of your gases coming out the back of the engine, pretty right. much. And in, in the jet pipes, you've then got some um, what we call thermocouples that are measuring your jet pipe temperature. But they're really important because they, they tell you, you know, what the engines are doing in terms of engine health. So whether they're getting too hot or whether they're in, in the correct um, optimal temperature range. I so see. They're, they're quite important. Is that, um, is that during flight or, or, or mainly for, 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 for takeoff or all, all all, at all time? All times, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So your, your, your RPMs and your temperatures are, are important. Obviously, you're keeping your eye on your fuel gauges all the time because these yes. things are always fuel critical. Yes. These are fuel critical by the time they get to the end of the runway. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially with afterburn. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, in, in reheat, as we like to call it in England, yes. um, you're burning just over two gallons a second of jet fuel per, per engine, so it, it's, it, it's frighteningly. It, it, you can actually see these gauges going down with the naked eye. You know, Incredible. Um, and of course, so uh, um, uh, cockpit temperature is important. I guess that's the, uh, that's the blower there, is it? These are the blowers here, just to... No, no. Is it not? These are the, these are standard warning panels. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. So the, these are things like this to tell you... Uh, oh, there's lights behind these right, uh, fins, yeah. are there? So oh, okay. lights telling you that your fuel pressures are... Yes. They're, they're, they're dumb, really. They're not... There's nothing smart about them. They're just... Yeah. They're, they're normally attached to a switch. Right. And the switch turns the light on or off, so that gives I you see. things like your fuel pressures and your oil pressures. Um, pressurisation, cockpit pressurisation. Uh, that sort of thing. Now, in terms of your cockpit um, temperature controls, that's what this is here. I see. Uh, no, it isn't. There it is. Uh, so you've got an air conditioning pack um, in the nose. Yeah. Uh, and you just select your temperature in here. It's automatically regulated. Just air conditioning. Nothing fancy about it. Yeah. And is, um, this, is this the radio set down here? Or? No, that's your radio there. Okay. So this okay. is a, a UHF, VHF compatible radio with all your channels on it. Um, this here is your autopilot. I see. So you can set your climb, your height, your heading, your attitude, your track and glide. Um, that was quite a complex system, very, very clever for the time, you know, because this before the microchip was invented in 68, so everything was done with, um, you know, analog signals and relays. Wow. 
Mm. Wow, yeah. very, very, uh, very complex and, and like you say, advanced Massive. for its time. Massively complex and very advanced and really quite stunning that it all works. <laughs> yes, yes. So I see you're, uh, let's get back to the aircraft. Yep. Um, I see you're, uh, d you've are you been doing a little bit of work up there. What, what were you doing earlier on up there? Um, so that's all the engine starting equipment up there. Um, the, all those black boxes are timers and various controls. Um, and that is purely just for starting the engines, uh, which you'll see later on. And the monofuel that I spoke to you about, um, that's what's in that jug up there and the big tank. So I'm just topping up that. Um, and then we've already done what we call something called fail safes, which is to check that uh, the engines are actually going to start. We did that earlier on, so that's yes. all done. So we'll just be topping up the fuel on that and shutting the lid. So she had uh, she had the capability of, of carrying quite a lot. I don't see any um, uh, in terms of armaments. I don't see any uh, uh, anything slung under the wing. Did she? Would she have had pods under the wings? Yeah. So this, the, the F, this is what th this version is the F fifty three, which was the Saudi or, or the Middle Eastern variant, if you like. Yes. Um, these were very capable. Uh, the F six is the RAF had could could carry, could carry uh, missiles, and these are the two. These are five street missiles. Or dummy dark fire streak missiles, practice rounds, these are called. Right. So you can fire fire streaks on here or red pops. I see. Okay. Um, also under here, we sell very various. There's another weapons pack. You could carry uh, what they call microcell rockets, uh, little rockets that could fire. Um, if you point your camera over at the Harrier there, you'll see that it's got what we call SNEP rockets on it. Yes. And you'll see one. there's a little blue rocket there, just as an example of what it fires. Um, this lightning could also carry those. Um, they would be mounted to the wing here. We've got the pipe, we've got I've got you. for it. Yeah, yeah. need some work so we haven't fitted them. So you could carry under, uh, understore bombs here, rockets. It could also have them mounted on top. Um, Splitting the wing is for... Uh, that's uh, it, at the back here. We've got what we call an inward vent valve. So it acts, does two things. As you use fuel in the wing, when the fuel's going down, you need to let air in. So in here is a special valve that automatically lets air in. Um, and these uh, leading edge slots were fitted, uh, I think, fairly early on in the Lightning to give the outer wing more stability to stop storm. Wow. Wow. Um, that's quite unique. You don't see yeah. that on many airplanes. No, you don't. Most airplanes have wing fences. So if you yeah. look at the Harrier, you'll see there's. It's got wing fences on the leading edge. There. Yes, it's yes. The same thing. So, oh, I see, oh, I see, okay. Uh, but English Electric and their wisdom decided that since they put a slot in the wing for that function, that they'd also use that to uh, allow air into the wing as it draws fuel down. So just going back um, briefly to the um, to, to, to the whole restoration of the aircraft, that it was in, what, what year did you... Uh, did it arrive here? 2006, uh, did you say? 2000 it arrived. 2000, yeah. wow. So we started working on it in 2001, early 2001, wow. yeah. So in total, uh, it took how many years to uh, to get it to... Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's still an ongoing project, isn't it? You're still working on it, but... Oh, well, it's always constantly being maintained. Yes. I guess about 16 years, 16, 17 years, I think, overall. That's, that's impressive. And that was, uh, I think... We started off as a team of two of us till about 2005. And then from 2005 onwards, I think we generally had about four people working on it. Yes. So we were probably putting in about uh, maybe 50 man hours a week between the four of us on it. So, yeah. so the plan today, um, as as with every time you uh, do an engine run on her, is to uh, run both engines. Yeah. What we do. Um, because we're running the aeroplane statically and you're not getting any ram air cooling effect on it, there's lots of little ducts around this aeroplane that force air in for cooling things. Um, we try not to stress the airframe too much when it's running statically because they get very hot. So what we tend to do is we, we, uh, we start number two engine first, which is the one on top. Um, we run that for about three or four minutes. Then we start number one engine at the bottom. We run the two together for about three or four minutes. Then we shut the top engine down and leave the bottom engine running for another few minutes and then shut it off. So I suppose overall we've probably run for about anywhere between 12 and 15 minutes. Okay, that's impressive. At various power settings. At various power settings, right. Cycle all the controls so people can see things moving, that sort of thing really. Excellent. So uh, you've been very patient, as have all the guys out here. I believe you're ready to tow her out. Uh, yeah, let me check. <coughs> What are you doing about rolling out then? Um, well, I mean, if you look over, 
Give it another 10, 15 minutes. You look over the south. Maybe, you know, what, 15 minutes? Yeah, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, okay. Great. Okay. That's fair enough. <laughs> She's uh, <laughs> yeah. a. Yeah. 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 A bit like the Seven Bridge. I don't know if you want to have a chat with Dave. Yes. Uh, uh, well, actually, do you want to chat with him? Dave is our chief engineer. He knows all about the Seraphite. He, he was one of the ones that put it together in the first year. Wow. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. I'll hand you over to Mr. Scrace. Says you. I want to get a microphone. Andy Scrace. Andy Scrace. <laughs> Welcome, sir. So, um, tell us about your uh, your involvement with the project here on the aircraft. So you say you, uh, um, uh, was was saying the first year you worked on the, on her in the first yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So, so literally when she was in bits. Yes, yes. So she came to us from um, Marine Salvage down in uh, Portsmouth, close to Portsmouth, um, and she was literally a kit of parts. The the two wings were separated. The nose was off. The fin was off. The stabilizers off. The tanks off. No engines. They were everything removed, jet pipes out, breathing really pipes out. So it really was a big kit of parts, um, and it took us probably it took us a good six months, I would say, initially. Once we sort of gathered everything together and started to put put it all together, um, and then uh, you know once we got the airframe assembled, which was. <laughs> There's lots of photos, I'm sure we can dig some out for you actually, there's lots of photos of it being put together. Um, it sat for a, quite a long time, not actually doing anything at all. Right. Um, because we were then trying to work out what kit we were going to need. There was always the intention, because we had these two zero-timed engines, it was always the intention to get it ground runnable. So when you say zero timed engines, unrun, they, they were so they, literally they, new? They were, they're, not, they're not new, they've been through the refurb facility right. at East Kilbride. So, um, yeah, so basically, yeah, they were, they were good to go straight out of the workshop and, and, and good to go engines. Is there an example of one of them over there? Or is it, yeah, let's, let's just go and have a little look at that. It's not a big shiny one, but... Um, no, that's fine, we don't, we don't mind it's not shiny. <laughs> So this is her here. So a lot of people would expect it to be quite long, but it's actually quite a... Quite a, a yeah, the, the engine's not, not that long at all. That's, um, so this is an Avon engine, is it? an Avon, it? yeah. 302 Avon. And um, that's basically... The one, the one in the aircraft, the only difference between the one, this one and the one in the aircraft, the one in the aircraft has got grey painted compressor case. Right, rather than right. Black. <coughs> So would this be classified as a low bypass? Uh, not a bypass. It's, it's not a bypass. Jet. Pure, 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 pure turbojet. Turbo yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, pure, pure turbojet. Because it has the reheat capability and it has, uh, yeah, so yeah. It's a reheat is, is what it um, relies on. Of course, obviously a lot of the modern stuff like the Tornado, uh, well, even the Buccaneer, the Phantoms in the Buccaneer were, were a low bypass ish engine. Yes. Um, where, and obviously the um, the RB one nine nine and the the um, EJ yes. fan engine. Yes. So. Wow. Yeah. So this casing is uh, that's cast. It's yeah. Much like the old uh, the old Merlin engines had that that type of casing around yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, so inside at the front end you've got the, the so this has got a very very compressed amount of blades in it. At yeah. The front I mean we've, it's not the same engine but uh, we over here we've got one that's uh, split over in fact. Okay. Let's just yeah. go and have a look. So it give it's it's the same type of. Uh, Sort of like um, makeup, so to speak. Yeah, I'm guessing. Very yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. This is a, yes. This is a sapphire engine. Right. And uh, it, 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 in itself, it's very similar to the Avon. As yeah. you can see, we've got a compressor section, low pressure compressor here, high, high pressure compressor into the combustion chambers. Which, uh, sorry, that's into the combustion chambers. This is where the fuel would be sprayed in through these okay. strange little hockey sticks here. Yes. Um, so that's the bang section so of the engine. A, that's where the fuel vaporizes in there, mixed with the compressed air, out through the stators into the two stages of turbine. Wow. Just there. This would obviously all this would be rotating. Yes. That way. <laughs> yes. So basically, the air is coming in through the front. So in, in through here. 
in through a, a guide vanes just there, first stage compressor. So it gets squeezed in there. And it's it squeezed, and the, 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 it's tapered because you, you, you need to keep the velocity down, because what you don't want is you don't want the, the air to be coming through here at such a huge velocity that it actually blows the flame out. Yes. Um, so that's why the stages have uh, come down in, inside. Wow. Interesting. So this is the gearbox up front, is it? Yeah, that's the starter gearbox. So yeah. this would be the, the starter. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure what type of... I think it's an air start on this. Right. Um, and that's just a, a small gearbox for the starter. And then you've got a bevel drive here, and there would have been a drive shaft. You can actually see the accessory bevel outside. I see. Yep. Yep. And the gearbox would have been mounted around the front of the engine here. Oh, so I that see. would drive okay. your fuel control unit, your oil pump, um, any accessories, generators, any other accessories that would have been on the engine. Right. Okay. Interesting. Great cutaway. Thank you, sir. There's another, there is another cutaway further down if you look. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Always, uh, always interested to look. I mean, we can um, possibly have a look through the uh, through the museum as well while we're at it. I'm guessing. Captain Chris there. <laughs> A350 Virgin Atlantic pilot. Oh. Wow. That's pro proper restoration, isn't it? Oh, this one, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, an Orpheus that's been fitted to a fallen gnat. Okay. Um, and uh, so you can see the same sort of thing. Your compressor yes. in the front, combustion chamber, slightly different yeah. combustion chamber. This has got cans as opposed to the annular one that's in the. Oh, I see. The, yeah, so. yeah. Separate cans, which is very similar to the Derwent over there. Yes. Um, uh, well, I actually call this can annular. So um, it's cans inside a chamber, whereas that's ex exposed over there. You can see exposed right. cans around it. Right. So again, um, it's uh, it goes down in. Uh, yeah. Airflow through the front. Yeah. This is this is the nose the nose case. This one's actually got its gearbox attached to it. It's actually cast into the bottom of the engine. Oh, I see. Yes. So you've got a generator on here, and I'd say fuel pump underneath. Um, so it's sort of like its own APU system, uh, its own starter system, is it? Yeah. Well, it, this would have had. Um, I'm, I'm sure this would have had an air start. Um, right. As most of ours have. In fact, well, apart from lightning, which is av pin, which is, you'll see later. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, the engines here are air, air start, same as an airliner. You know, most most modern airliners now yes. are, uh, are, are air start, except for a seven eight, obviously. Yes, which is right. Goes right. back, it yeah. goes back to the yeah. good old uh, starter generators. Yes, yeah, it's very impressive to to, to utilise electric uh, electric starting on a mm. on a modern jet liner, but yeah. uh, that's well, something. You see the size of the motor. I yes, it's, it's that round. Or yeah. That. Yeah. Two of them. <laughs> yeah, incredible. And this is our Venom. It's a Swiss Air Force Venom, and uh, this is this is under a deep restoration. Yeah. Um, we, we, as you can see, we've dropped the, the uh, collector fuel tank out, and we, we've actually got to jack the aeroplane to get it out fully. Yeah, that's only half out that it's tank half, at the moment, isn't it? Half out. Yeah. So you've got to jack that aircraft up yeah. level as well. Yeah. She's got to go up level, and it's going to be interesting because you're going to be very close to the ceiling at the back. Yes, I so, see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then that will be um, that, that's uh, an ongoing restoration. She would suffered because it's it's built very similarly to the Mosquito. Well, the nose yeah. is yes. Um, so it's timber. So it's, this it's is this is actually ply and balsa wood laminate. Wow. This is ply skin on the outside, balsa wood in between. Crazy, like the Mosquito. Exactly like the Mosquito. So it's, it's, it's a De Havilland, Havilland aircraft. Havilland yeah. Back, yeah, yeah. Wow. Very impressive. And then this is the Buccaneer, is it? No, that's, that's the Gloucester Meteor. The Gloucester Meteor, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah Gloucester right. Meteor. Buccaneer's through there, is it? No, or? the Buccaneer's outside. Oh, the Buccaneer's yeah. outside. Right, OK, outside. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, And this uh, used to fly with the Vampire a lot at the uh, old um, air shows that I used to go to. Yeah, yeah. They, they used the, to be a pairing, didn't that's they? Right, the, yeah. Uh, the, the, the pair, yeah. So the Vampire is, is very similar to. The yes, pair. indeed. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Which came first? I 
think it was the Vampire, actually. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I like the way that these aircraft are, are, are in their original state and they haven't been all night beautifully sort of like painted and, and new new coatings and stuff. I, I, I just think it's it's really authentic to see them like this. They've had, the, this one's not in its correct paint scheme. Is it not? No, this has actually been painted in a Royal Navy colour. It was never in the Navy. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but even so, it's just the, it's just the, it's just the sort of like, um, shabby chic type look yeah, to it you yeah. know I, I quite I quite the, uh, like that the grand plan for here is to try and get as many of them the ground runnable as we possibly can really and wow. we've the Vixen was ground runnable up until we had problems with the throttle cables yes um, that's an ongoing project to get that back to ground running the Harrier is a project to get ground running the Venom that was running and will be again um, I believe this Vixen, from speaking with Peter yesterday, was used uh, towing drones, was it? Yeah, to, yeah for, target, to, a target tow. You used to yeah. uh, tow... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. You're not going, are you? Yeah, we're going. Oh, you're going, are you? Yeah, oh, is it? Yeah, it gives you cars. Oh, mate. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I've got you on... Um, I've got you on... But we must touch base. Because I'm up with you for a regular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I stay up there all the time. Um, so okay. I stay at the Renaissance. Oh, right. yeah, right. yeah. Okay, okay. Would, yeah, okay. I'll contact you. Are you on LinkedIn? You're on LinkedIn, aren't you? You're possibly, yeah. Okay. Chris Paul, P O H L. Okay, okay. Right. Chris, great to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Take care. All the best, yeah? <laughs> See you soon. That footage was excellent the other day. All our colleagues have got that. Oh, that's fantastic, mate. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, we won't talk about that live on air. <laughs> Cheers, man. <laughs> um, yes. It's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it, when you look at an aircraft like this from a, from a distance or when it's flying. It looks really small. But it when does, you get up yeah. next to it, it I mean, is impressive if, how big it is. If you've, if you've seen the, the, uh, the Royal Navy historic flights one, uh, flying when it was in these red colours, it doesn't look that big. No. It's, it's, no. But we had the same thing. When, when we had a carrier here, we, we, were, we always thought it was really small until we brought it in the building. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you come up against the uh, logistical problems. And what's, uh, what's interesting about the Vixen, is uh, is how the um, the cockpit canopy is offset because yes. I believe the navig was it the navigator yeah, it was na uh, who would sit sort of like below him. That's it. But, just, in the, uh, just in this section here. Yeah, yeah. All we had was the, the, the little glass bit here and this small window to peer out of. <laughs> yeah. So pretty lonely old flight for him. Yeah. Especially as he's sort of like all he can talk to is the knee of the pilot. Um, but uh, just we can have a, a good look at an example of it there. Yeah. Very odd. Surprised that didn't do anything sort of like to upset the airflow. Um, I think because of the design of the aeroplane, it probably doesn't really affect it too much. I mean, right, the right. Twin boom, yeah. it's got two fins. So it's very stable it's at the back, stable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, um, it is a strange concept. And I've, I've ground run this a couple of times, and, and it, when you fold the wings, it's, a, it's quite a struggle to see that wing coming up. Yes, because sort of sure. we're, we're, we're talking about a, a, a folding wing here that, uh, for, for anybody yeah, who doesn't carrier. know what we're talking about. This is from a carrier because yeah, they actually... Carrier-born aircraft, so it's a Royal Navy, uh, 50s and 60s. And from that section there, out board, and yep. fold over the top of the aircraft, and that's so they could stow it into the, under, under the carrier deck. Yes, yes. And this is uh, this is one of the APUs. Yeah, this is ground start uh, unit, Palouse ground start. This is still used today for, for starting the Buccaneer. Fully serviceable. Um, so for anybody wondering when they see the back of an aircraft and you look at an APU, that heat coming out the back of the aircraft, this is basically they're more or less all the same size in terms of uh, yeah. Of, of, yeah. yeah. They're, 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 there's not like massive ones and little ones. No. It's uh, these. So, 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 folks, this is um, basically what, what is stored or stowed underneath the um, the tail section within, in the, in the, behind the bulkhead of a, of a, of, of a modern jetliner. And Peter told me yesterday that uh, um, for, 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 for taking it to airfields where they didn't have a, a ground power unit, they'd uh, sling one under the wing, yeah. which is quite interesting, uh, which is an example of which is over here. 
This is a, another, another one that's under, under restoration. We have tried to run it and um, it, it, it lights up but doesn't self sustain, so we've got right. some bits to do right. with it. But yeah, basically, yeah. It's, uh, if you take these panels off, there'd be the intakes both sides into here. We'd open up that uh, tail cone here. Is it going to behave? No. <laughs> of course it doesn't. Uh, we'll do on live TV. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, it's exactly the same engine as you've seen over there on the deck. Because that would have been used on the carrier deck, that one. So and this would have been wired up and... and, and it's literally mount on this pylon. Yep, and, and just feed directly into the aircraft systems. No, no, it's, oh. it's, not, it's, it's even cruder than that. There'd be a hose attached to it. Which would then plug into oh, I see. here, yes. on this yep. side. Yep. You take the hose to the air start unit underneath, and it would be used exactly the same as the deck one, but just mounted to the aeroplane. Wow. So. Wow. <laughs> Very impressive. Well, the trouble is, well, the trouble at the advantage. Look at this lank. Is that a haché lank? Wow, that's a beautifully built Lancaster bomber. I think that's the haché. Is this the haché? Is this the haché model? I see. This is hand built. Yeah. Wow. Beautifully done, beautifully done. As are uh, all the other models, to be perfectly honest with you. Fantastic. We are happy back stuff. Sorry, got a bit distracted there. That's no, all right. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's one of those, those places, there's so much to sort of take in. Yes, too. yes, yes. It's so great to have these guys here today because uh, it just adds a little bit more to the... Uh, yes. To the, uh, what's it? So, um, this, uh, this Harrier is a uh, later variant with the, uh, with the... I guess that's radar, is it? Is uh, that yeah, it's a, it's a GR3, so it's, a, it's, it's supposed to be early. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, a GR3 Harrier. Um, Again, this came to us uh, in a pretty poor state, um, and over the last, well, certainly over the last couple of years, we've managed to acquire an awful lot of stuff for it, including the correct engine uh, to go in it. Wow! Um, we so that's had yet a very to be early Pegasus that would have been fitted to a Kestrel. In fact, it would have been in, in fitted to a development Kestrel. Um, the museum not far from here, Wings Museum, some friends of ours. Yes. They have um, they have a Kestrel, and they've gone and collected this uh, engine from Holland, and we said, well, do you want to swap? We've got a, we've got a Kestrel that will go. Well, we've got an engine that will go in your Kestrel, and I said, yeah. Okay. So we did. Fantastic. <laughs> Should we just have a quick look at it because yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, uh, being as it was a VTOL uh, aircraft, um, these are the. This is the, the, the. So, this is a, a, a bypass engine, and I, I, I say it's a high bypass. Right. Um, I think it's two or three stages of fan in this one. The, the other one we have was two. This is probably three stages of fan um, in this. So you've got this stage, another one back here, another one back yes. there. That's your cold, cold stream air, and your cold stream comes out of the front two nozzles. So behind you there is the, is the cold stream fan air coming out. Which is directional uh, there, there, for, there, for there, up and down, yeah, for uh, vertical and... Yeah. and so, the, yeah. so, so all four nozzles are coupled together, and they all move together. They're, they're right. independent of each other. Right. They, all, they all move together. But that's cold, and the so back end cold. is hot. And then you've got the, the, the this is where the, the, the fuel nozzles are, just here. Combustion chamber will be inside here. And then turbine section, which you can see if you stick your camera up. Look. Yeah, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. This is the, obviously the hot, hot nozzles. Now, the cold nozzles mount to the airframe, and the hot nozzles mount to the engine. 
which is why there are no hot nozzles on the aircraft. I see, I see, because they, yeah. they are already mounted to, to the engine. The engine's not in the aeroplane. So that's um, got to be a pretty uh, pretty uh, uh, complex operation, getting the engine into the aircraft with the nozzles attached. So, no, it goes in as it is. Oh, OK, and then the nozzles now, are attached the afterwards. Nozzles put in afterwards. I see. But to put the engine in, the wing has to come off. <laughs> wow. Okay. It's a one-piece wing all the way across. Wow. And uh, so it's trestled underneath here. Yes. Fore and aft. And uh, the whole wing comes off. The engine's framed in from the top. Attached. Wow. The, a lot of the equipment, as you can see, is on the top of the engine. Much yes. gas turbines. You sort of see all the accessory gearbox and everything be underneath. All to the side. This one, everything's on top. So once the wing is off, it's relatively straightforward because you've got an open, an opening Come which. Back in two years, not yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. <laughs> so is this the the paint scheme as it was, or? No, when it came here, it was just grey, and again, it had been painted with Royal Navy, which it, it wasn't. Um, it's, if I'm right, I believe it had, it was a GR1 originally, uh -huh. and it had an incident where it ended up inverted in a field, which uh, obviously damaged the fin, and after they'd rebuilt it and done what they do, uh, it was converted to a GR3. So when you say inverted in a field, you're talking it about upside down? A landing incident and flipped on its back. Wow. <laughs> so that must have seriously damaged the tail, oh, yeah. the vertical yeah, yeah. fin. Um, wow. So that's obviously a part that you've acquired, I'm guessing. No, no, I mean, this, it, was, it was rebuilt by the Air Force. Oh, I see. Was, uh, okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, after the incident, it had been taken away, rebuilt. It was, I wouldn't mind betting the whole back fuselage would probably change. Yes. Interesting. A bit like Trigger's broom. It's, it, it, most of the military aeroplanes are, are a bit of a mixture of lots of bits and pieces of one from another to... Yes, of During course. the war, they used to do that. You yeah. know, the, yeah. the uh, Spitfire would crash in the field somewhere and they'd go and take the wings off and pull this off and a bit would go there. Yeah, bit would go yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. yeah. of course, of course. OK, so uh, we're back at the Lightning and the, uh, the boys are still not, uh, not ready yet to uh, take her out. I think we're probably getting close to that point. Yeah, um, I'm yeah. I'm probably going to have to give them a hand in a second. So. so maybe what I could do is I could go outside with my audience and uh, we can just have a look at the uh, Shackleton. Yeah, and, we um, a quick, quick walk around the chat yeah. while these guys are yeah. organised. Because this is the... Uh, the Shackleton is the, uh, the other live exhibit that you've got. She doesn't have the luxury of being inside a... Uh, of being inside the... Um... We're ready then, buddy. We're ready. Yeah, yeah, come on. Okay, we are ready. Okay. Well, there's the Shackleton, folks. We'll, uh... we'll, talk, we'll, we'll, have a chat we'll get on to that in a little bit later, because yeah. uh, hopefully um, Peter's going to walk us through that. Because uh, I had a walk with it through her uh, yesterday, and it was yeah. uh, very... Um... Pete, Peter, it, it, good. He's, ex, he's an ex-Shackleton guy. Yes, so, uh, yes, he was on, on it. Although so. I've been involved with that since 1991, wow. when we started getting her running. She's run pretty much every year since. Uh, not as much as we'd like, but she has her little issues. Yeah, yeah. A bit temperamental. temperamental old grey lady, yeah, that's all yeah. I'm going to say. What, was it, what is interesting is um, uh, one thing that I did ask um, uh, uh, Peter yesterday was about the, you know, the contra-rotating blade system. Yep. And the reason why they have contra-rotating blades is because they, because otherwise they'd need massive blades. Yeah, massive. They were... uh, a massive. I mean, it's a, it's a two thousand four hundred and forty-five horsepower engine. Um, we can, if you know, as soon as we get the lightning out, I'll actually show. We've got an engine in the in here that we can show you. Uh, right. And also, I've got a very nice draw uh, diagram of the the reduction gearbox and it is so simple is it it's so simple you just wouldn't believe it i've had people here saying how complex it is it's not wow it really is because you would think it wouldn't you <laughs> uh, having two you're talking about two drive shafts basically it is, it is two drive shafts run through the one through the other um, and uh, literally the best thing i can do is show you the photo photograph out of the manual and then because, we can just uh, yeah, then we can yeah. just well, if you if you ca catch me after we've got this out, yeah, we'll, we'll go and have a look. Yeah, definitely. And then I'll hand you to Peter, and he can. Good do man, it. good man. Right, do you want to give me that just in case there's a, some <laughs> head language. Cheers, man. <laughs> Everything all right, Judy?
clearance on that uh, on the fin. Not a massive amount of clearance on that vertical fin, then, Dave. That's crazy. Really? Oh, I can see, yeah, they had to take the, the cap of the fin off. To get the clearance under the roof. It's close. That is close, isn't it? I bet every time you do that, it's like... Dave just told me how to take the cap off. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting putting it in later once it's lighter. <laughs> right, yes. Two-stage operation by the looks of it. Pull her out to a certain point and then uh, hook her up to push her into her final position.
<laughs> and there's the tail cap, folks. Authentic. I mean, are you going to get that up there then? A rope ladder. A rope ladder. <laughs> oh, you got a cherry picker over there, right? Okay, yeah. That's great. Which we be very useful because we use it for washing the shackles and down. Yes, yes, right. Sharp. Great, isn't it? Yeah. Look at that. Still got the cobwebs in it. There's a screw for it on there. Crazy. Yeah. Unfortunately, because the building is stepped, yeah, reduce yeah. the volume, yeah, the height, so that we can have a bigger capsule regulation. Oh, brilliant. Oh, bless them. This will not be on flight radar or plane finder or any of your uh, radar apps, folks. <laughs> It's a CF6 engine over there, by the way, folks, if you're wondering. It's not a, what I thought was an RB211 initially when I saw it, because it was the blue cows that uh, caught me off guard, but it is a CF6. Not running, unfortunately. Just a, an exhibit for the, uh, more for an educational part piece uh, for the school kids who come in here uh, on a regular basis, obviously. Not at the moment. How long now before she uh, before she lights up, so to speak? Oh well, we've got two runs today, won't it? Okay. Uh, 12, 12, 12, and three. Twelve and three. Yeah. 
Okay, wow. Okay. No, it hasn't been decided which one's going first. Radio. Oh, okay. Alrighty. Okay. Well, I'm sure that uh, as I was uh, discussing, oh, there's our man Pete, Peter over there. He's a bit of a character, old Pete. And this is the um, the Pito. Um, so they're bringing the Jenny out. This is the uh, Air Start Jenny, I'm guessing. Oh no, it's not an Air Start Jenny because it's uh, it's it fires up on a, under its own power from uh, from memory, from what he was saying. But uh, this generator's just giving some kind of power. The Pito. So this is an airspeed um, pito, I'm thinking, that's going in here. This may seem silly, but it doesn't fit in the building with it on. <laughs> Understandably so. And it is a bit of a health hazard, let's face it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, a, um, is this an airspeed pito, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pito, yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> Peter. He's our man over here. Good old Pete. <laughs> Ash has volunteered to go up the intake today, so. Oh, is he? Do that now, yeah. What, that young lad there? Yeah. Um, okay, so we have the uh, intake inspection now, folks, uh, which is uh, going to be quite interesting. You can't have um, the Michelin man going in there, I can assure you. So, uh, ladies and gents, there's the Shackleton. Um, a derivative of the Lincoln which was a derivative of the Lancaster um, AV row designed and developed those aircraft and uh, as you can see a completely different intake setup on the uh, Griffin engine uh, as opposed to the uh, Merlin engine much bigger capacity I think it's um, in terms of its literature. Hello, sir. Hi, I understand you're looking for somebody who knows something about these. Yes, you're Nev. I'm Nev the Nav. Yes. Okay, Nev the Nav. Yeah. So uh, we can we can walk through with the, this with you in a, in, a, in a little while, can we? All right, yeah, okay, yeah, Nev. Like. That's wonderful. We'll uh, we'll do that. We just want to see experience this whole um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. the, the, the 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 FOD check. Yeah. <laughs> It's nice, uh, healthy diesel. A bit like a 767 startup, no? <laughs> oh, I missed that. Okay. Oh, well, never mind. So this is going to be interesting, isn't it? Wow. So now you can see the bullet, folks. You're like this, what do you want? Stand that in. Fair play. Cheers, mate. See you later. See you later. See you later.
Done that before. He's coming out. the lightning uh, detailed lightning discussion walk round and so on and so forth we'll jump onto the Shackleton now folks um, now where's Nev where's Nev Position and ready to run. Good thing is that with there being moisture on the grass, you're going to see, uh, you're going to get a good idea of the power of the engines. It's a burn strip, as you can see behind the engine there, that burn strip there. So. Give you a good idea of the uh, the force that these engines run at. Right. Okay, folks. <clears throat> Here we go then. Just wait for old uh, Nev to finish his conversation. Shackleton. Um, maritime reconnaissance. However, not just reconnaissance, but um, also. Uh, carried ordinance as well which we'll, we'll, we'll touch on in a little bit which I found very interesting so not only would they um, locate track and um, uh, 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 um, basically um, drop sonars um, to uh, to find submarines uh, very very sort of like very complex operation that uh, that they used to uh, to locate um, enemy submarines. Uh, obviously, when I say enemy, it would have been uh, during the Cold War period. Well, uh, just prior to the Cold War period, I'm thinking that the Shackleton. I don't know exactly when they went out of service, and the uh, the likes of the Nimrods and the uh, the jet-powered aircraft were, uh, were were brought into service. I don't know exactly what period that was. That's something that we can ask Nev. And obviously, you guys are letting me know this right now. Um, but um, but also, uh, what is interesting uh, about this aircraft is um, it does have, believe it or not, two jet engines. Um, because uh, the outboard engines, in order to, um, in order to uh, operate from short airstrips or to get the aircraft up quickly, uh, the outboard engines actually had a couple of uh, turbine engines. Uh, which were mounted behind the uh, the Griffins. Griffin. And uh, there you can see the uh, air intakes for the jet engine. Well, I, I, I only found this out yesterday, literally. Uh, very interesting to note that uh, the outboard engines uh, were equipped with... Uh, there are some other aircraft that also have... Um, jet engines uh, I think it might have been uh, some of the uh, was it the, not the Strata Fortress the uh, Super Fortress maybe some of them had jet engines attached retrofitted at some point 
Um, but uh, also, um, as we were talking with, um, with our colleague earlier on about the um, contra-rotating blade system and the fact that it is a relatively straightforward um, let's just go and see if we can get a look at that cutaway whilst um, Melvin is still uh, chatting away. Wait a minute. Where is he? Where is he? Where's he going? Andy, you were going to show me that. Uh, that, that. Oh, yeah, the, the griffin. Let's yeah. Okay. That's right. <laughs> So the outboard jet engines were primarily for short airstrips, were they? And for uh, yeah, it's a, it's assisted takeoff unit. In fact, that is the engine from it, just sat over here. Oh, is it? So, wow. um, so it's a turbine it's, engine. It's, it's basically two Viper engines, which were doing the same engine fitted to a jet Provost, exactly the same but similar, wow. um, and numerous other other things. Um, and that's it, yeah, it's, it, it runs on AV gas, not, not jet fuel, it literally runs off the same fuel as the, the piston engines. Interesting. And uh, it's two positions, it's idle or full power. Apparently that's so, it. yes, <laughs> which is quite interesting really, so yeah. uh, like and your lump it. A bit like a, a JATO unit for, in the modern version of things, which would have been a rocket assisted takeoff, it just is, is, is a, uh, assisted thrust. Uh, the Shackleton ended up very, very heavy. In fact, Nev, I think you probably... Yes, yeah, yeah, he's going to be he's showing a, us around. He's an yeah. navigator and he'll tell you all about the Vipers and the, yes, yes. The, their use in, in service. So in terms of the cutaway or the... Uh... So we've got the, the Griffin uh, here. If we um, slide by on this... Oh, I've got you over there. Direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... So this is the Griffin, folks. So it looks very much like the Merlin, but obviously uh, same makeup in terms of uh, 12 cylinders. 2,445 horsepower. Um, <laughs> and you can see here, yes. take these shaft protectors off. There's your twin shafts. And there's your two shafts. So you've got your back propeller here, your front propeller here. And in the middle, it's not on here at the moment, but I can show you one because there's one at the top of the hangar. It's called a thing called a translation unit which I'll talk about that in a minute because that, that describes how we change the pitch of both plate blades at the same time. But basically it's like a helicopter swash plate. It connects the piston, which will be on the front here, to the front, the, the piston connects to the front propeller. Then that has a series of racks going through it which control the pitch of the blade that connects to the translation unit, which slides along this shaft and that is a bearing, like a helicopter shot swash plate, that then transmits the same into the racks in the back. And so they're all connected. Right. It's so simple. So the it's blade pitch will be uh, the same on both, bo both, both the front and the rear props, because yeah. otherwise, uh, obviously, it'll rip it. itself apart. Yeah, it but, um, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the two shafts, but, so, obviously, here we go. This is the cutaway of how simple it is. Oh. This is the crankshaft coming in at the bottom, okay? Yes. And if you see here, it's got a gear at the back which is meshed with the front prop. Yes. Okay, which is this shaft. Yes. And that tra that one travels through a set of bearings, through the back shaft, and that's it coming out there. Okay. Through the front shaft. There's a little idler gear just here that picks up. If you see there, there's a, there's a gap between that gear and, the, and that gear. Right. What happens is it, that little idler gear connects that gear to this gear, and that is it. That is all that's in there to make it a contra-rotating propeller. That's incredible. I've had people tell me it's the most complex thing, and epicyclic gearboxes. No. 
Wow. Not at all. So just the split shaft system, really? Just literally, the crankshaft comes in, it's got this coupling on the end of it, it's a flange coupling, it just sits on, it's exactly the same as a Merlin actually, it sits on the, uh, on the end of the crankshaft, um, and then you've got um, like the main crankshaft oil feed goes down that tube there, right through the middle, Yeah. and then you've literally got that meshing with that, that shaft, and via that idler gear, that, that front one meshes with the... Incredible. The back shaft. Incredible. And that's it. That's the and they starter. basically just just rotate in opposite directions. Yeah, yeah. Just by just by putting one gear in, it turns it. The and why do they need to uh, uh, operate in opposite directions? What's the purpose of that? It's um, it goes back to um, in the, at the time there wasn't the technology to have the five blade and six blade or six blade propellers. Yes. Um, so they they had to have to double the area. Um, you couldn't really produce something that uh, drove, but there would be such a huge mass driving right. around. So in the one centrifugal way. So force would it, 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 it basically what what happens with the contra-rotating propeller is it cancels out the torque. Right. So you have a huge amount of torque. Yeah. This big mass of propeller. Yes. What happens here is the torque gets cancelled out. One's going one way, one's going the other. So the, okay. Okay. And of course the the uh, Griffin 74, I think it was. Fitted to the C547, which there's a model in the cabinet down there, contra rotating propeller. Pilots, we've had a C547 pilot here, he said, the aeroplane flies like a jet. This is there's no talk, there's yeah. no talk to worry about or anything. Yeah, yeah. It flies like a jet. And interestingly, is that anything to do with the fact that when we see the engines fire up later, it's a much smoother fire up than the Merlins? Because it seems to be very, <laughs> it seems to be quite smooth. It you can, know, it can be. Um, we well, touch wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 will, it will go well, but um, it, I don't think the propeller adds adds much to that. It, it, yeah. Maybe just the engine. The engine's a single point fuel injection on this, um, so basically just shoots. Um, that's the supercharger there, and it's just an injector that sprays straight into the center of that. I see. Um, sing, uh, single point, a bit like a car, really single point fuel injection yeah. on a car. So a little bit um, more, uh, a little bit less complex than the, yeah, than the no, Merlin startup there's, system. There's no carburetor. There's no. Yep. Um, oh, sorry. Can I just okay, mate. Yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> Folks. Right, let's go out and meet. We'll go and meet Mev. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Melv, Melv, Melv. Nev, that's it. <laughs> uh, should we go out the other door? Is that door open there? Let me just have a little look here. Hold on, folks. Uh, no, I don't think it is. It just saves me going under there. That's all. Right, where's Nev? Two gentlemen just on the left there that you might want to talk to. Okay, I'm just going to go have a word with Nev. Oh, the rain comes yeah. down. Right, let me go and get me rain. Um, let's. Uh, oh. Hey, didn't know I'd lost you. Sorry. Okay, okay thanks. Right. Uh, Let's just, uh... <laughs> we have wings, folks. We have wings on the van. Okay, I just need to uh, get some, because uh... the rain has started to, uh... rain's just started to come down now. Um... The, uh, where's the rain jacket then? Uela jacket a la rain. Uh, I think what I could probably do, I could probably just put this over it. No, 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 I'm not going to try that. Folks, you're just going to need to bear with me um, because the rain is, it's just started coming down a little bit heavier than I'd like. Uh, obviously need jacket on the camera to protect him and uh, oh, I know where it is, it's in my pocket. <laughs> Shh. 
stupid boy. Uh, it's in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Okay, we got it. We got it. We got it. Right. Um, you're gonna uh, just, just, just bear with me. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you're not going to go anywhere. We're just going to get this on so that I can. Uh, It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's a bit like walking around with emu, this is, when you've got this on. Except it doesn't grab older people and start pinching their bums and things. Okay, we're good, we're good. Right. Oh, that's just that's an A321 going out of Gatwick. La 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 la. Okay. It's always better to talk to the old timers uh, when it comes to things like this. Nev the Nav. Morning, gents. You've got a nice job today. Yes, isn't it lovely, eh? <laughs> so we've got Nev the Nav here. That's me. How are you doing, Nev? Nice to meet you. How long have you been with the uh, Gatwick Museum then? That's a good question. I oh, actually, hold on a minute. Let me mic you up. Uh, do you want to just put that on your... Same as what I'm doing here. Yeah, yeah. Just put it on your zip. There. That's it. Is that on there? No, not yet. That's on there. A little bit more. It might be able to could go on a little bit. There you go. I'm holding my breath. <laughs> okay, okay, Jilly. Have you got uh, hands up, just hands have you got up, pick Nev, Nev up? Talk to me, Nev. Okay, about the Shackleton. Right. Got him, Jilly? On Hold on. You got him, Jilly? Before you start, I'd like to just ask you a question. Okay. Can you lose your mask, Nev? Because you're outside. Yeah, we'll stand back from you. So okay. You're okay. Just try him again, Jilly. Just try him again. Want a little bit of history about when the track started. Yes, we, we'll, uh, we'll 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 go through that in a second. I'm just 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 double checking your your mic setting. Oh, okay. Okay. Say hello to me, Nev. Hello, hello. One, two, three, four, five. Is it all right, Jilly? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Well, let me. Okay. Well, let me turn my mic. Let me turn. Uh, I'm, 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 okay. Right. I've turned my mic off. Now. 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 Let Nev talk on his own. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Hello. Hello, everybody. This is Nev speaking. Okay. All right. Well, you don't need me yakking on. Uh, Nev, we've got you. Uh, thank you once again for uh, for for uh, yeah. Let's let's just go bang straight into it. Tell us about the Shackleton. All right, the Shackleton first flew in 1949, 71 years ago, and um, tailwheeled aircraft, and quite difficult to land as well. Now the the Mark II came along in 1953, another tailwheeled aircraft, quite difficult to land, but it, it's uh, some dramatic changes on the Mark One. We can I just can I just stop you there? When you, when you talk about a tailwheel aircraft, you're still talking about the old Lincoln and, and yeah, Lancaster-style yeah, Lancaster, yeah. setup. Yeah. So so quite a lot of uh, design changes obviously had to be made in terms of its centre of gravity and so on and so forth yes, with the uh, with the front undercarriage. Yes, right. sorry, right. right, okay, okay. So where was it? Yes, the the, <laughs> the Mark One had the radar. If I can come. Around. Yes, yes. Uh, under the nose here. Okay. It didn't take too long for a big seagull to come along or a buzzard or something like that and whack into the radar and goodbye radar. So they moved and the seagull. radar down yeah. the back end there behind yes. the wings. Yes, okay, we'll have a little look at that um, because it's quite interesting that, uh, I mean, this is, uh, so interestingly, they, they changed the position of the radar um, to front and then and then put it back to the original position where no, no, in the Lancasters they would have been on a, a, a H2S sort. That's right, they were about in this position here but fixed. Yes. Now, shall I continue yes. talking now? Yes, yes. So this is the radar scanner here. It's made in sections 
and we keep it up when we're in transit. We don't need the radar in transit, in other words, we're flying from one place to another place to have least drag when we don't need it. Then, when we get to uh, our search area where we're looking for warships, submarines, that sort of thing, um, we're doing a lot of turning, and when we're turning with the radar up here, the wing would get in the way of the radar picture, okay? So this drops down in sections, and it's uh, about 12 feet long, okay? When it goes down, it's longer than the undercarriage. So in fact, if you, uh, uh, if you have a hydraulic failure, you've got to get this up uh, before you can land. Wow, okay. so that must have caused a, a significant amount of drag on the aircraft and, and instability yeah. maybe. True. No, not as, no. Uh, drag certainly, but we're only flying along when we're... Now let me go back to a, a stage. When we're in transit, we're flying about 145 miles an hour, okay? When we reach our search area, to save fuel, pull the engines back um, and run them at a lower power setting, and we're chugging along in search mode uh, at about 125 miles an hour. So it's only a bit faster than the, the BMWs on the road today. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, so this uh, doesn't have a great deal of, uh, of drag effect. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm talking as a navigator now, not as a pilot. All yes, right? but yes. It didn't affect me as a navigator yeah. one iota. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, and then well, on our way home, we pull it back up again. Right. Okay. Right, so we got to the, the Mark II 1953, where the radar was now in this position here. And in the nose now, we would have a pair of 20 millimeter cannon. And they're not for shooting at aircraft. They're for shooting at submarines in wartime, of course. Yes. Uh, if we've got submarine on the surface that we catch on the surface, because this aircraft is basically uh, uh, trying to locate diesel electric submarines, just like German U-boats during the Second World War, they spend most of the time on the surface. The reason for that is they go faster on the surface than they do underwater. Okay. So they transit. The submarines will transit towards a target on the surface. That's how we catch them, either with radar, or the, ra the submarines could also detect our radar and go underwater. So often we don't use our radar, and we use these, given the right conditions, obviously visibility, okay? So, if we caught one on the surface, we've got 12 Second World War depth charges in the bomb bay, which the navigators like me set up as two attacks, six depth charges at a time. Okay, so we've got a clockwork timer, guaranteed to work every time, so tick, 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 wind it up, set the aircraft speed, select six depth charges, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the second attack would be seven to twelve switches. Anyway, we've got those set up. During the daytime, pilots do depth charge attacks, so we get a radar contact, radar officers guiding the pilots in towards it, the, sub the pilots see the submarine, Target sighted, attacking, bomb doors open, they guide the aircraft over the submarine, attacking weapon now, they hit their weapon release, and the depth charges release one at a time, that's the submarine, one, two, three, four, five, six, spread over a hundred yards in the hope that one of them sinks the submarine. Okay, that's daytime. Now, as we're running in, the guy in the nose, that's the nose lookout up there, the guy in the nose has got a little joystick to to point the, the weapons and a firing button, and he would be firing at the, uh, at the submarine on the surface, trying to make holes in it with his 20 millimeter cannon. Okay, so that will be a, a, a depth charge and, and a 20 millimeter cannon attack on a submarine on the surface. Or periscopes going through the water. Yes. Anything we can see. Yes. You can't attack a radar contact. You've got a fit. It might be a friendly fishing boat. Yeah, but there was there, there was never any uh, um, physical uh, um, um, uh, attack scenario that you had. Um, okay, not a wartime one, you mean? No. Yes. No. This uh, this aircraft has been involved in small wars. Yes. Uh, I've never I've trained for these, but I've never actually been involved in any of them. Uh, in the mid '60s, for instance, there was confrontation with Indonesia when Malaya was trying to form with other small countries uh, in the Far East into Malaysia well the Indonesians didn't like that and they were attacking Malaya and so we were asked to go out and protect them Wow uh, and um, so that was one scenario um, with 
some uh, with live yeah yeah oh yeah wow yeah, yeah. wow and also in south yemen which had north yemen which was marxist sending like the taliban in afghanistan yes through to south yemen and killing people you know blowing things up and all this yes sort of thing. Uh, so we were it, we call it the protectorate of south yemen because we were asked to come and protect them from north yemen so this was always in a maritime scenario uh, yes mostly um yep. The Nimrod that I went to afterwards was used in the desert, Afghanistan, yes. uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, yes. Syria. Yes. Uh, that was definitely not maritime. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. It maritime as well. Yeah, yeah. There yep. was a lot going on in the Gulf, Indian Ocean. Yes. So the um, but the ordnance capability of this aircraft could even carry up to nuclear uh, armaments. Yes, we had uh, a war load would be um, three torpedoes. Uh, 12 Second World War death charges, killed a lot of German U-boats, nothing wrong with them, and two nuclear depth bombs, they're small nuclear weapons, uh, so they're not there for killing millions of people, they're to kill submarines, yes. so they're quite small, they got off quite deep. I did have one visitor here one day who thought that uh, that was a kamikaze attack. In other words, we're going to die in the uh, in the attack. I said, no, we, we don't go attacking submarines like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they go off quite deep and yeah. they're small. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, um, the, no doubt as we're flying away as fast as we can go after dropping one, yeah. there'll be a big whoomph from yes. behind us, but yeah. we'd, we'd still be get home to our families yes so um so sonar detection was a, was another form of uh, of 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 detecting uh, yes. now in the bomb bay in a war load we have uh, and quite often in a training load as well 20 sonar boys at the back end here they're about this tall about that round and uh, the navigators again we control those and if we got a a radar contact on a, a small radar contact Radar operator thinks it might be a submarine. Um, let's say it's night time, so the pilots can't see anything. Uh, and the radar operator is guiding the pilots in towards it. Now the submarines have a mast that they keep up. In fact, the first one they put up is what we call ESM these days, Electronic Support Measure. Picks up other people's radars. Now we have this, and on the on the top here, an right aerial there. Looks like a big spark plug. That's our, what we call, orange harvest. It's just a code word, but it means it picks up other people's radars and we'll get a bearing, and from the size of the signal, you can tell how far away, roughly how far away it is. Little tiny signal, the radar you're picking up is a long way away. Big signal like this, missile firing radar, wartime, just about to get shot down. Okay, wow. well, submarines have that as well. So. As we're running in towards this submarine, this radar contact, submarine picks up our uh, our radar and goes underwater. So radar marks this screen where the submarine went underwater and gives the navigator who's at the attack table a bearing and range of the submarine where it went underwater. Now we've got a projector system at each of the two nav tables that projects a light arrow, about that sort of size, down onto our tables uh, and it's got a little arrow head, a little bar like that, and that's where the aircraft is. So uh, the, the uh, tactical navigator can now guide the aircraft to where the submarine went underwater, select a pattern of sauna boys, and we have different patterns, different kinds of sauna boys. Uh, the first nav decides which, one to, which pattern to use, uh, and drops a pattern of boys across where the submarine went underwater. So you're tracking it, basically. Well, uh, first of all, the, so the sauna boy casing floats, with a whip aerial popped up like that, sending signals back to these aerials here. Yes. And on the other side over here. And we've got two sonics operators who can measure the bearing and range. Now, the cap of this sonar boy falls off and a big underwater microphone like this sinks down on a long cable. Wow. 150 feet, I wow. think it is. Or, or nearly, you know, whatever that is in meters yes yes <laughs> 50 meters yeah and then the son the microphone starts rotating round yeah listening for the submarine propeller noise it's sort of yes yes sort of noise. yes and that the guys looking at the sonics equipment Let's see which way it's they see the the bearing come up like this now uh, they've got a bearing cursor here that starts north east south west 
So there's the bearing cursor. Here's the noise from the submarine propellers. So a little winding hand there, wind, 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 wind. Wind that over the top. The other guy does the same thing with his sonar boy. He's in contact as well. Those two bears, the, the tactical navigator's got a glass plate here with a, a, a circular uh, plotting chart on the top of it. And underneath, there are what we call lighthouses, which project uh, uh, bearings up underneath. So I've got right. a sonar boy here, sonar boy here. The two bearings from these two guys, there's the nose of the aircraft. Maybe I ought to do it this way around. Nose of the aircraft. We're all facing this way, by the way. Yes, yes. All right. So uh, they're sitting here behind me, and the two bearings, they send the bearings through. Like that, that's where the submarine is. Pencil, plot. And then as the submarine moves, uh, the bearings change. I'm plotting fix, fix, fix. I know the submarine's going this way. Got to drop a torpedo 300 yards ahead, which is about that much. Yep. So I've got a six inch rule, yep. with 100 yard markings on it. Sliding that along here, now I've got my aircraft arrow being projected down here, so I can guide the pilots round, bomb doors open, select the torpedo, deselect the depth charges, because the submarine's underwater, All right, select the torpedo, or a nuclear weapon, if we've got authority to use it. Yes. Uh, and still plotting fixes, plotting fixes, sliding my rule on, aiming the pilots 300 yards ahead, and then attacking weapon. Now, in goes the torpedo. Off it goes. Fantastic. In training, I can say I've killed loads of submarines yeah, in yeah, theory, yeah. but I've never hurt anybody. Yes. Because in training, we use little practice bombs like this. Yes. And they uh, they go off with a bang, and the people in the submarine go, hmm. By the loudness of that bang... Was too far away or very close. Torpedo, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have sunk us. They yeah. fire off a green wow. candle, which floats to the surface, and we see green smoke during the daytime or yep. green flame at night time. So whether you've hit it or not. We've just killed another submarine. Yeah. So where, where would most of this um, uh, the, the, the simulations take place? Because we've been to Donanook and uh, out yeah, into the... Well, uh, the south, well, southwest approaches, west of Scotland. Yes. Uh, but, uh, well, I should say, most of the submarines I've attacked have been simulated. Not right. That, we didn't have a simulator. Right. But we had, uh, at our bases, each of our bases, uh, we had a, a big plotting table yes. with a, an electrical submarine, if you know Right, right, mean. yes, and yes. Controlled by little knobs, yes. so you can change its direction right. and speed. Right. Uh, and it's got a pen underneath it, yep. uh, which is drawing where the submarine's going, and then the, the guy who's were operating this are marking every minute or something like that, every 30 seconds maybe, uh, marking where the submarine is with the time. Yes. Okay? Now, in fact, what we have a, a, a radar boy which is uh, about 30 miles off the coast, more to the seabed. Yep. And we use that as a submarine. I see. Okay. It's moored, it doesn't move. Yes. But we can get a radar contact of this. Yeah. Home in towards it as though it's a real submarine. Pretend it's gone down. And now there's nothing in the bomb bay. Yeah. So I can operate all the switches. Yeah. And, and dummy drop sonar boys on a submarine that's gone underwater. And then I've got a little grid which I can lay and and work out the uh, the positions of the sonar boys. Yes. Then I give it to my other navigator here, who radios the guys on the ground, and tell them where I've dropped the sonar boys. Right, right. Now, the sonar boys are transmitters uh, mounted on this big table up here. Yeah. Uh, and they can be slid this way on rails. Yeah. Or they can move this way on their rails. Yes. So they put the sonar boys transmitters. Yeah. In the same pattern, I've dropped them in the water. I see. I see. And then. But underneath, there's a little uh, uh, lead ball which you pull down on a wire right. and couple that up to the, sub, to the sonar boy. Right, right. So as the submarine moves away, the wire follows the submarine round from the transmitter here. Yes. So you get a bearing. Right. And the length of this gives you the range. Right, right. Okay, so yes. you've got three or four of these all going at the same time, sending it to these two guys here. Yes. Who are. Uh, I mean, it, they're coming from real transmitters, yes. like the real thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's exactly like the real thing for them. And they send it to me, just like the real thing. Yes. And I'm, again, plotting fixes, plotting fixes, guiding the aircraft out, attacking weapon now. Then I tell the uh, my second nav here uh, where I drop the weapon, and uh, he transmits it to the guys on the ground. They plot it out and say, 
you've missed. <laughs> right, right. Because they know when you're going to attack, yes. they'll turn the submarine. Yes. You imagine I'm, there's the submarine going this way, I'm guiding the pilots out 300 yards ahead, the submarine suddenly goes like that. Yeah, yeah. I have to get the aircraft coming, this is where you handle it, like a fighter. Yes. This big heavy old thing. Yes. Final big boot full of rudder to get it round, and wings level, wings level, attacking. Um, you know, it's easy to and of course, you've got to always uh, drop your 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 ordnance on a level on a level yeah. platform. 300 feet. Yeah. Uh, 300 feet. Interesting that uh, a lot of people uh, uh, were, were were not aware of the um, the use of a, uh, of a of a jet engine on the um, ah, well, on the aircraft. Which did you three. did you um, did you uh, did did you have experience of it being I used? Did. Oh, really? Um, yeah. I haven't talked about the Mark III yet. This is right. the Mark III with the nose wheel. Yes, Much yes. easier to land, this aircraft. Yes, of and course, yeah. It's 12,500 pounds heavier wow. than the Mark I and II. Wow. Now, most of that is fuel. Yes, uh, this right. This aircraft will fly generally uh, 15 and a half hours, something like that. Now, I did three years on these, then I went to the Mark II, and then we're flying 10 and a half hours. That's the difference in fuel. Yes, so yes. We've got. 12,500 pounds extra weight with the same four piston engines. Yes. So this is like being in your car with two rugby teams sitting on the back seat and you put <laughs> your foot flat on the floor while yes. you try and get it to move. Yes. So we had a bit of a problem. The poor old engines were flogging themselves to death just to get us airborne. When yes. It's hot. Yes. Uh, the air's thinner. Yes, of course. High altitude. Yeah. Airports like uh, Nairobi. Yes. Um, where the air's thinner. Yeah. We had a problem getting airborne. So they fitted two Viper. So these are the Griffin piston engines. Yeah. Immensely powerful. Yes. But not powerful enough for this engine. Yes. For this aircraft. Yes. So they fitted two Vipers. One up here in number one engine. Yeah. And another one in number four engine. Now. Yes. We only use them, now there's a bit of contention here, I'm going to say we only use them for 10 minutes. Officially the books all say, including the Avro books, two minutes. Oh really? Well, uh, you're That's... supposed to use them to get the aircraft airborne safely uh, uh, and then switch them off. Well, right. this aircraft, when switching the jet engines on to get them safely airborne, in two minutes, you've got yeah, to be joking. Yeah, yeah. So my memory is. So you're talking about running them up and getting them to temperature and. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown on that in a second. Uh, yeah, it, it takes time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, let's imagine. Um, yeah, it's ten minutes as far as my memory goes, but it's a long time ago. Yes. So let's say the engineer starts up the piston engines, the pilots taxi out to the runway. When they're ready, the engineer lowers the air scoop, so it's got two switches. The two air scoops go down hydraulically, and then is no throttles, just two switches on, and the two jet engines light, light up, and he's got the RPM gauge and the temperature gauge, so you can see the engines are working correctly. They come up to full power, and then the pilots bring the pistons up to full power, off with the parking brake, we then take off, and as far as my memory goes, once we're safely airborne, undercarriage up, flaps up, and we're safely on our way, Ten minutes later, the engineer switches the jet engines off, air scoops up, and with this up here, you'd hardly know there's a jet engine in here. Right, right. From the hole at the back, right, of course. With right. The gun back. So you very rarely, um, well, I say very rarely, but in terms of like uh, percentages of, of, of using the, the jet engine versus yeah. not using it. Well, it all changed in my time. Yeah. Uh, I was on the uh, 206 squadron at the time up in Scotland. We had an aircraft that lost two engines uh, uh, off Portugal, well out in the Atlantic off Portugal, and um, they, they had to, the captain decided to light up the Vipers. Right. They were on their way down. Right, really? Yes. And so uh, they flew to uh, Lisbon uh, Airport uh, on two pistons and two jet engines. Wow. Now, the, the reason we only use them for 10 minutes, of course, is Jet engines use jet fuel, yes, and that lubricates the bearings and gears before it gets burnt to produce yep. the thrust. Well, we don't have any jet fuel; we have petrol, yes, which is not a good lubricant. Yes. So the worry was the the bearings and gears wouldn't be lubricated. Properly. Yes, yes. Now, when they strip the engines down for, that have been running for two hours, yeah, to get them into Lisbon, yeah, they found there was no real problem. Oh right. That. So they changed the on-off jet switches into what we call engine controls. Right. So the engineer 
Start off with inch, 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 inch them up to 106%, I think it was. OK. Uh, full power. We take off, and then he dropped them back right. to 97%. OK. For our jet engines like cruise. Yes, cruise yes. RPM. And then we fly for two hours with the piston engines pulled back to save their, uh, you know, their life, basically. Yes, yes. Engine life. Yes. Uh, and running on the jet engines as, as well. Oh, as that's the, interesting. Uh, and then after two hours with the aircraft burnt fuel, so it's much lighter now, yeah. uh, we shut the two jet engines down. Yes, yes. Uh, they're always available for emergencies. Yes. But that's how we did it from 1966. So prior to 66, it was idle or full power, but well, then they switched uh, I to... On, I flew in the first one that we, we got at, uh, at Scotland on the squadron I was on, 206. I flew a, a, in a, um, an air test, yes. the first Viper fitted Shackleton that was delivered to Kinloss. And that was sometime in 66, I think it was. Wow. Might have been 67, wow. I think it was 66. So prior to the, to, to the Viper fitting, how, how, how sluggish was it getting off the ground? Is that the only only was it only the Mark III that was fitted with the Viper yeah, engine? The Mark III. So yeah. because of the weight, the the, the weight, additional yeah. weight. Yeah. But 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 the early Mark Threes, they all they were all fitted with the Vipers or, or no, not? No, no, the early ones. Really? Had four pistons. Wow. So. Well, in the cold winter, shall we say? Yep. Yep. It is very thick. Yes. And good and loads yep. of lift. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, most of my time was in Viper fitted ones. Uh, yeah. I, I think it was towards the beginning of '66 because that's when I first started flying on the Mark III. Right, right. Uh, and um, they certainly at uh, Scotland, which is fairly cool compared with yes, down here. Yes. Yes. Uh, the air is quite good, but I've been on another uh, incident at Nairobi where the temperature was roasting. Yes. We tried to take off at two o'clock in the morning, and. Um, we had one Viper unserviceable, and uh, we we actually took off as we went over the end of the runway. Uh, and wow. Uh, wow. the the, uh, the crash crew had been scrambled. They thought we would really? make it. Yeah. Well, we nearly didn't make it. Wow. It was uh, a very dangerous situation due to the heat, the thinness of the air. Yeah, yeah. The density. Yeah. Of the air. It's just struggling to, yeah, to, yeah. to get airborne. But even with one Viper and four pistons going flat out. Yeah. Yeah. And it just made it. And 13,500 foot runway too. Wow. That's a long runway. Well, in fact, the, my pilot who died uh, a few years ago, he was uh, joined in 1943, he was a Spitfire pilot. Vast wow. experience on shacks. Uh, he, he wrote his story, which I put in the Growler magazine, our Shackleton Associated magazine, where he said, I had full power on the engines, one Viper going full power, took off the parking brake, and uh, took off the tow brakes, and the aircraft didn't move. <laughs> and then he said it, it started to move to a slow walking oh, pace. Oh, wow. And then a fast walking pace. Um, I can't remember the, the numbers now, but yeah, it yeah. the sort of thousand foot marker, I think it was, at um, 60, 60 miles an hour. Wow. You know, and anyway, he was trying to decide a vast experience. Yeah. Uh, he, he decided as much better to continue than just try and stop the aircraft. Yes. Um, wow. Close shave. A close shave. Yeah. Should we go on board the aircraft, Nev? Uh, officially, you're not allowed to. OK, well, we went on it yesterday uh, with, with Peter. Yeah, 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 he's quite happy for us All to uh, right. okay. be well, uh, shown not, around, so... Don't worry about contamination. Yes, of course. No, I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a big bomb bay. Well, I don't know if you're recording now, but... Um, yeah, we're, we're live, Nev, you're live. You've been live... When I joined them, we didn't have <laughs> steps like this. No, of course we not. We had a ladder which is inside. I yes. When, now, if you can imagine a rickety old ladder, yep. this one in here is not the one I remember. No, the no. The one I remember had a hinge in the middle, so you could fold it in half. Right. And take it on board so you can get out at the other end. Right, so yes, of go. course, of course. Okay, this one in here is a more modern one. Yes. Quite rigid, but... If, yes. If you can imagine me with my big heavy bag full of all my stuff. Yeah, my yeah. Bag jacket, Trying to get up dome, that uh, step... In the middle of winter, the staircase. The rain, yeah. Slow yeah. Wind, yes. Up that ladder, yes. I used to go up it through the nose, what I call the gentleman's entrance. Okay. <laughs> Much safer. Okay. Here we go, folks. So this is um, 
completely authentic. Uh, these lovely leather seats up here, I, I think yeah, they're just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But we're trying to get them uh, covered. Oh, you've got lots of money. Yeah, there's the ESM, the Orange Harvest. Yeah. Of which we'll see the instrument. Yeah, you will. Uh, flare shoots there, yeah, I'm we guessing. We have problems with this door. Ah. I love the old ashtrays as well. Okay, here we go, folks. So, first, uh, now when I was in here yesterday, obviously I didn't have the backpack on, it was just a walkthrough with Peter. Yeah, yeah. So we sort of like went through the, uh, oh, there's the general. The there's your ladder. Yeah. Two, two sections joined together. Yes. But well, that is far more robust than the one I used to come up here. Yes, on. right, is, right. And the guys used to bring up our ration box which was a great big box like this, big heavy thing. Yeah, yeah. And that would have all our saucepan, frying pan, um, Fantastic. that sort of stuff. <laughs> and all the boxes of tin food that we had for 15 and a half hours. They'd be pushing this one person at the top, yeah, pulling yeah, all, yeah. a couple of boats at the bottom, pushing up that flipping ladder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's this position here then? Right, these yeah. are the beam seats, right. beam lookout seats. Yeah. Now this is the probably the more important one. Yeah in that when we're taking photographs, now uh, normally I would have some photographs here, I'd show people yep, uh, yep. A, a Russian warship and a Russian submarine. So these are lookouts uh, basically, they're, visual... They're lookouts, and the domed windows are so they can look down here, because I see, if, yes. for instance, search and rescue is another important job of ours, yep. we'll carry search and rescue load will be dinghies yep. in, the, in Bombay, and flares underneath here to light up the scene at night time to, so a helicopter could uh, yes. uh, see, you know, for picking people up. But our main job was uh, handheld photography right. to take photographs of Russian warships and any yep. submarines we caught on the surface. Yes. So the pilots, once we found something we wanted to take a photo of, the, the first pilot, the senior pilot, would bring the ship or submarine down the side here, yep. and I would have a big box down here with our yep. camera. Now the camera is in the museum, uh -huh. it's quite a spectacular camera, yes. really heavy, Yes. and the guy, uh, one of the guys, say from the galley, would come here, open up this box, grab the, uh, the neck strap, it's really heavy camera, yep. and sit down here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now the pilots would uh, normally we're at 500 feet when we're searching. Yes. Okay. So we f transit 1,000 feet. Uh -huh. Then when we get to our search area, we drop down to 500 feet and pull the engines back 125 miles an hour. And um, so for photography though, pilots would drop down to 400 feet. And no matter what the weather's doing outside. Wow. We don't take photographs from plastic. Yes, but of course. Funny enough, the air going past yeah. actually sucks the air out. So, uh, yes, yes. But it's it's really cold in the winter time. Yes. And you've got two really noisy engines just out of here. Of course, here. yes. <laughs> so, uh, as the ship or submarine comes down here, the parts will drop the wing. So we're we're looking down at that sort of angle here. Yes, yes. And this guy click 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 click. And shut that bleeding thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When he's finished, yes. shut that up. Yeah. But funny enough, people are, in the winter time when we get visitors here, freezing cold in here. Yeah, yeah. Say, How do you keep warm? Yeah. Well, keeping warm is no great problem. We have uh, petrol heaters in the nose. Yes. Uh, one for the Bombay. Yeah. Keep, keep the weapons all nice and warm. Yeah. And the other three, I think there there are. Um, uh, they burn petrol, yep. heat up the air, yep. fans then blow it through the aircraft, and we're relatively warm. Really? We're a long way away from it down here. Yes, yes. So it's always uh, pretty parky here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but these positions are only manned when they need to be manned. They're not somebody sitting here permanently, uh, is yeah, it? Yeah, but we need to be manned uh, most okay. of the time. Oh, I see. OK, OK. Uh, search and rescue, I, we're one, we only need one navigator <laughs> yeah. for that, because yeah. it's not going to tax submarines and things. No, no. So uh, I would often spend some time helping out with lookouts. Oh, I see. Here. OK, OK. Because, uh, uh, yeah, I was going to explain, by the way, these are domed yep. uh, so that you can look close, because if you're yes. on search and rescue, uh, debris, uh, bodies, yes. you see them down there, not, yep. not out there. Yes, of You've course. So you need to also be able to actually lean out. The right. tail lookout, yep. which everybody has to go down there to learn how to stop being sick. Right, um, right. It's like being on the end of a tuning fork and it's going like this as you're flying around. Yes, <laughs> yes, right, right. Okay. Oscillating. It certainly is. Yes. And you're laying on your stomach facing backwards and looking downwards. Oh. Oh my goodness oh, me. Right. Yeah, it's uh, not nice. 
Anyway, um, right. So moving that's on. That's our toilet. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the Elson. Oh, sorry, Elson's behind. So still use the old El Sand toilet yeah. then. Wow. And, uh, there on the left, there's the stand-up bit. It's a gentleman's aircraft. Well, I don't know about gentleman, but it's yeah. man's aircraft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, these are the uh, hydraulic jacks for the radar. For the radar, right? yes, this is yes. Down here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we have. Four six barrel flare dischargers here, yep. and these are where the flares go, so they're, they're about that long. And um, these are for night attacks on submarines, right. or in practice, most of the time, right. uh, on, on our radar boy that I mentioned earlier. Yes. Okay. We use that as a submarine, and we do night attack and day attacks, by the way. Pilots do daytime attacks, we do nighttime attacks. On yes. A totally different trip. Right, right. Eight hour trips for uh, training. And these. Um, when the bomb aimer calls out flares, flares, the guy down the back here presses the start button and these fire one at a time every one and a half seconds. So they're sort of boom, boom, yes, yes, boom, and pow. They yep, light up yep. the sky, more importantly, they light up the sea because yes, the bomb yes. aimers looking down yes. a mile. So they are illuminators basically yeah, are for, illuminators. Uh, for the bomb aimers too. You have no problem seeing submarines yep. because it's the wake. Yes. from the propeller or even a periscope going fairly slowly through the water. Yeah, creates a, yeah, a, a, a wash. A, a white. It yeah. really does show up yes. very white. Yes, yes. Now, this is the galley. Yep. And these are cold rest bunks, but we never use them for that. Yeah. This is where we stored all our food. Right. We've got a ten-man crew. Um, often we'll have a couple of passengers as well. Coast Guard people, uh -huh. some ground crew admin people. They come along once. They see what it's like. Everybody's yeah. sick when they first yeah. come on there. They don't come again. Yeah, uh, yeah. They don't you get, come again. You get used to it after a while. But this is where we store all our food. Yeah, we've got, yeah. say, 12, 12 hungry men, and we're flying for maybe, uh, often our trips will be 12 and a half hours. Yeah, yeah. But they, that could stretch to 15 and a half hours, yeah, yeah. typical. A training trip, eight hours. Right. But anyway, right. a lot of food, all our tin food here. Yes. Uh, and up here, a whole load of eggs, bottles of milk, loaves of bread. Lime and uh, Riley. Summertime sandwiches. Yes, yes. Uh, that sort of stuff. Right. Uh, and, and a with, kitchen, a fully equipped kitchen with. Well, uh, let's see, hot water hot for water tea, heater, coffee. Yeah. Also a sink for washing up yeah. because uh, we cleaning had... cleaning in my uh, kitchen. In my days we had china plates, <laughs> stainless steel yeah. knives, forks and spoons. Now we yeah. have a saucepan and a frying pan we've got on here. Riley, yeah. And our main... we we'll have two main meals, yeah. Uh, yeah. which we call honkers stew. Now honkers might be a, a strange word to you, but it's the... Um, a slang term for being sick. Okay. okay. <laughs> nice. Everyone is sick when you first join this aircraft yeah, until yeah. you get used to it. Yeah. So we call our main meal honker stew. All right. Anyway, the saucepan will go on there and then we uh, switch on the electrics. Yeah. And then uh, open up tins of beef, potatoes, carrots, peas. Blimey, O'Reilly. And, uh, and then add whatever the crew like. Fantastic. I like what's the sauce in mine. What about a simple, uh, simple yeah, toasted a, sandwich? Well, uh, it's not exactly do. a um, George Foreman, is it? Well, I like to do was uh, <laughs> leave my second nav navigating up the coast of Norway because yeah. the Russian naval yeah. base for the North Atlantic is right up around the top end of Norway. Right. Now we're flying at about That's 145 weird. miles an hour so to get from Scotland to the top of Norway is about three hours yeah yeah right so you've got a long, nice long time yeah I'd yeah. leave my second nav navigating up the coast of Norway right. after we're safely airborne I come down the back put the frying pan on a couple of eggs oh butter of course with yeah. any really nice healthy oils yeah yeah uh, a big chunk of butter yeah wallet Two eggs, crack, crack, into there. Open yeah. a pack of bacon or some sausages. Bish, bosh, bash. Into, into the grill here. Yeah. And uh, four slices of bread, two bacon egg sandwiches, Bob's two jungle. cups of tea. And I've had baked beans on toast with bacons. Wow, nice. Scrambled egg. You know, toast, you make me bacon. hungry, Nev. That's just a snack Easy, meal. son. <laughs> snack meal, okay. Yeah. A and snack then, meal, flipping heck. Yeah, and two main meals, they're the honkers. Blimey, yeah, O'Reilly. Yeah, of course, your honker stew. Yeah. So, a little rest area. This is the, uh, well, this is the uh, uh, dining room. Oh, area. okay, right. Yeah, oh, so very sophisticated, look. Yeah, yeah. Got your own table and everything, look. Look at that. Well, often the pilots would come back here. Yes, because They need yes. to stretch their legs and yes, all that. Yes, of course, uh, of just course. Together, I think. But we never use these, in my time, certainly. For rest. Bed. Yeah, okay, uh, yes. Because yes. they're full of food and all the rest of it. Of course. <laughs> and then we have <laughs> the tactical items. area. Yes. So, so, Nev, were you a tactical navigator or the... No, no or we the... have two... 
We do things different to the rest of the world. Why, I don't know, but we do. Okay. In, in, um, uh, the rest of the world has a plane commander. Yeah. And if he says we've got an engine or some sort of problem, we're going home. Yeah. That's it, we go home. Yeah, yeah. And they have a TACO, a tactical mm -hmm. commander, mm -hmm. who, when we're searching, he decides on what oh, we're okay. going to do. And all okay. that. No, we don't have that. Right. We have a first navigator and a second navigator. Oh, I see. And we swap seats. Oh, okay. Well, okay, so you can both uh, everybody multitask. Everybody else, you start off as a navigator yep. and then you become a taco. Oh, okay. And you never go back to being a, a navigator. I see. Okay. okay. Whereas okay. we do both jobs. Yes. Uh, yes. But no matter which seat I'm sitting in, I'm still the first nav. So this seat. this seat here is the, what, what, what position this one, is this then? Radar. Okay, radar, radar operator radar. in here. And okay, he can, so he's, control he's basically that controlling that big that old lump back. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So this is the this is the uh, this is the um, instrument that basically drops, lowers, or raises the, uh, no, the raises the, um, the, the radar. The scanner at the back. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Right. Uh, okay. And um, often we wouldn't use our radar okay. uh, because you imagine uh, if you're going against warships trying to identify them, if you use your radar to locate them, yeah. ships have something now. This is the equipment for that thing you saw on the roof. It looks like a big I see. spark plug. Yes, Picks yes. Up other people's radars. Yes, so I see. If we use our radar, ships can pick it up, yeah. identify us, yeah. they can aim their guns and missiles straight down the bearing wow. towards us. And so how do they pick up your radar using their radar detection systems, no, I guess? No, they have some, similar to this. Oh, I see, okay, okay. And what I should show you, I normally carry this around in my pocket to show people, especially teenagers, and say, anybody know what this is? Oh, wow. Do you Look know that. what this is? I do know what that is. <laughs> oh, well done. That's, um, <laughs> that's like uh, out of an old TV set, isn't it? Well, or radio a set. Now, yeah, right, but, right. Uh, most teenagers think it's a light bulb. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a question for grey-haired people, yeah. basically. <laughs> OK, but all of this gear here yes. is valve gear. Yes, yes. But they're military specification. They're made for a lot of bouncing around. Right, and, right, right. And even the pilots like to say they yeah. always make so, perfect landings, yeah. of course. Well, sometimes they do. Yeah, of course. Sometimes they In bad weather, yes. it can be yes. quite difficult to get it down. Yes. And you smash it into the ground, we all walk away and think, phew. Well, we're still here. Yes. Anyway, these are designed to withstand all that. So all of this gear was very reliable. Wow. And there's nothing wrong with the performance of these. These are better. Yeah. I had a professional musician here uh, a while ago, and he said he's for his guitar, yeah. he's uh, building a, an amplifier. A Using valve valves. Amplifier yeah. Yeah. Because the performance of these, the yeah. quality yeah. of the amplification. And I think like there's that. still so some, uh, some, some uh, manufacturers' musical amplifiers do. still using still valves. Yeah, Orange one. being one of them, I yeah. think. But uh, um, yeah, very interesting. So, so right, we're moving. back to this then. Yeah. So the ships would have something like this. Yep. They pick up our radar, yes. and if we get within uh, 500 feet, within about 15 miles, uh -huh. they can shoot us down. Wow. You know, so um, we can't identify ships from 15 miles, do you know? No, no. Uh, so often we don't use our radar, we rely on these, yeah, yeah. or we maybe put our radar on periodically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, we're, that you know, they can't yes. track us too, too yes. well. Um, anyway, that a very important piece of kit. Yes. Personally, in my view, it wasn't very good. Uh, at its job, but it's what we had in those days. Course, it was the course. only thing we had. Of course. Um, and, and I see it's on a it's on a rotational. Yeah. Well, we so don't have a big enough crew yeah. to to. So normally this would be right there. Yes. And this guy now our we have four senior NCOs who are training all of this equipment here and lookouts, galley, all that sort of mm -hmm. uh, side of things. Um, Cooking the beans. Uh, yeah, including that. And that air electronics officer in charge of them, and he moves them all around right. because on radar, after about 20-25 uh, minutes, there's a lot of eye strain. Yeah, 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 so, of course, uh, of course. The, the air electronics officer, he does his turn on there. So, they rotate, the so they rotate them? They rotate round. Oh, okay, interesting. Now, um, so, and they all do ground training in audio yep. recognition yes. of missile firing radars in particular. Right. Okay, so the radar operator will be looking at the radar screen, yep. listening to this. Yes. And uh, to give you an idea, the uh, if you heard Gatwick radar, for instance, on a big radar going round mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. you'd hear a noise from a zzz, zzz, zzz. Yeah. Zzz. If you heard a missile firing radar, the Russian the co our code names, NATO code names for these, all ended in screech. Right. Owl, screech, hawk, screech, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. If you heard it, it'd be a 
That's what he's... Hold on a second, sorry, sorry. What's, what's that, Jelly? Signal's gone. Yeah, you're inside. Is that it? Okay, let me move for a second. I think we might have to... I think we might have to uh, make this a quick trip. Um, <coughs> is it any better? If I've moved, Jelly? No? You can try up front. There's more grass up here, so... Jelly, you copy? Yeah, try on three. It's no good at all. Nothing... Okay. How much of that did we get? Was it, was it, was it, was it... Uh... Okay, okay. Right, it's settled down, Nev, so... Oh, uh, okay. So we can, uh, we can carry on, um, but Julie, just shout me if... Uh... Okay. So these are, I believe, are the sonar... Um... Sonics, we Sonics, call it. sorry, right. Yeah. Well, it's sonar. Everybody else calls it sonar. We call right. it sonics. Right, right. Um, but if I can go back a stage. Right. Uh, so I'll start here and work to there. Right. Okay. So we have two pilots up the front here. Yep. Um, engineer. And he's the one guy who's on his own. Yes. Right, we've got two pilots, two navigators, four senior and servers and an officer in charge of them one engineer for maybe 15 and a half hours. Wow. Okay, but we had a lot of engine problems and he's, his eyes are glued to the engine instruments there. Of course. And his things here. Yes. Uh, very important. So if he wants to stretch his legs and go and go to the toilet or go yeah, in the yeah. galley, he wants to have a break. Yeah. Well, the co-pilot would come and sit I there. see. Right, okay, yes. We always have that seat manned, okay? Yes, yes. And under here, these are the Viper controls down Oh, here. right, okay. okay, interesting. Yeah, because once we switch them off, that's his desk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Interesting. Okay. And then we have a radio operator, so he uh, does the, uh, 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 basically, the high-frequency radar. Yes. Long range, thousands of miles range. Yes. Okay. Um, now here, two navigators, so we have a first navigator, he's senior, and a second navigator, he's done a six month course, and over a number of years, he hopes to become a first navigator. Right, right. right? But we swap seats every sort of, depending on the first navigator, maybe every three, three hours. Yes, Something yes. like that, but doesn't matter which seat I'm sitting in, I'm still first navigator. Right, okay? right. So I could have my second nav here, uh, and I'm sitting here, but if we've got a submarine, uh, this is the attack table. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, you know, I might, uh, I'd make the decision about what kind of pattern of sonar boys we're going to drop, what weapon we're going to use, a torpedo or a nuclear, you know that sort. Yeah, of yeah, thing. yeah, um, yeah. This, this is the main spar I'm, I'm getting over here, isn't yeah, it? Two main spars. Okay. That one and this one. Okay. Jelly, just uh, keep an eye on the signal. I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is. Um, you Nef, I'm going to go. Side. I'm going to go past you there, yeah, yeah. You and then. Uh, there. You should pick, pick yeah, yeah. Should get a better, slightly better signal. You got it, Jelly. You got it. Yeah. Everything okay? Okay. So continue on then. Yeah, yeah. This go is ahead. the main navig. Now, as I said, all this lot here is all valve gear. Yeah, so yeah. Very reliable. And then here, the navigation equipment is all cogs and gears. Yes. It's pretty yes. reliable. Yes. Um, Much like the old uh, systems used in the bombers exactly, back in the day. Yeah, well, a lot of these were even used in the V Force. Yes. Uh, you right. know, the, the right. Vulcan Victor and Valiant yes. Uh, yes. aircraft. Uh, yeah, it's all cogs and gear stuff before yeah. the Nimrod came along. Yes, yes. The computers in it. Uh, the, the, the navigation equipment is driven by one of these two compasses here, and then. This is called the Doppler. Right. That measures the aircraft ground speed and uh, and drift. That's the difference between the heading of the aircraft and the track caused by the wind blowing us yes. sideways yes. a bit. So that feeds these. One of these will feed into here, and the Doppler equipment feeds its information into here, and that uses mathematics to calculate the aircraft wow. position wow. here and the wind uh, direction Incredible. speed uh, here. And I notice and you've got the old school uh, drift indicator. Well, this is one of the best pieces of equipment yeah. uh, because we did a lot of dead reckoning. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, there are some missions where you, we call them covert missions, uh -huh. you don't want to use anything active. Right, Doppler right. is an active sensor, so you switch yes. the Doppler off, or switch it to standby, technically. Yes, yeah. Uh, and to find the wind, then, yes. we do um, 
what I call a, a triangle of, uh, what do we call it, a multi-drift wind. We, right. We're flying along, you can look down here and see the, 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 the white caps, the waves, yes. going like this. Yes. And you can, you've got some uh, lines looking down there, you've got right, some right. lines like this. Yes. And you can move this, if, I, if it does move. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, oh, yeah, there we right. are, like okay, that. Yeah, and yeah. you rotate that round. Oh, for the angle of the, uh, the, of the... Yes. Yeah, the same angle that of, the waves are yes, going past. Right, right. That gives you the drift angle here. Okay. That's the angle between the heading of the aircraft Interesting. and the wind coming this way. Blowing Interesting. You. We're actually flying along this track here, yeah, yeah. but aiming that way. The wind's yes. blowing us down there. Yeah. Then we turn 60 degrees left and measure the drift. 120 degrees right, measure the drift. Then 60 degrees left and back on the original heading here. Right, right. And then you put these onto a handheld computer, draw the lines in, and that gives you the wind. I which see. Which you can then sit on, set on here. Yes. And then it, the system's working perfectly well. It works out the position of the aircraft yep, and, yep. as well as the wind. And we do a, a, one of these every 20 minutes or so. Right, right. Uh, it's a pretty accurate way of doing it. An alternative way. The, if we're flying fairly low, the pilots give us a surface wind, yes. uh, which they're giving us many times uh, during a flight. Uh, they can they can judge it looking at their compass. They can see the way the yes the the waves are going and yeah. blown yeah. by the wind, and by the roughness of the sea, they know it's a 20 knot wind, a 25, 30 knot yes. wind, or yes. or more. Yeah. And um, we can use that wind, allowing a little bit for the height we're at, which slightly varies the wind and put it on here that's another way of, of doing this and yeah. dead reckoning navigation can be pretty accurate yeah, uh, yeah. we do a 10 hour We've even got the astro uh yeah the astro the sextant yeah yeah uh, so uh in a dead reckoning exercise we can do uh, uh sextants yeah uh use the sextant for uh taking astro the mark ii shackleton was much better in that it had a big astrodome here yeah so yeah stand on this seat and yeah, be up here. into it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hang out my sextant there. I yeah. see all the stars. Yeah. Uh, and shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, whereas this one, you have to calculate everything. Yeah. And then you find the stars. It's gone all cloudy on you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so right. Uh, I didn't like noticed, this one. Uh, one of the old instruments up there was. Uh, I've, I've, yeah, I noticed well, uh, from the Lancaster bomber, um, uh, the um, bomb. Um, Oh, the, the selector, the selector, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which well, is... that's the uh, the uh, mechanical or clockwork. Yes. Uh, so that's the uh, tick, tick, tick. So yeah, it drops yeah. the sticks yeah, like, of six like, like this. Yeah. 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 Wow. You right. can't hear. It. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. 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 For okay. a depth charge attack, I mean, it could be six or or a dozen or yes. bombs. Yes. Uh, but uh, for depth charges, wind that up there, select six depth charges, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Set the aircraft speed here yes. to give the, the right release uh, yes. point. Yes. And then when the pilots or the bomb aimer, that's one of these You've as well. You've got the tip there. Uh, hits that, this goes. Tick, 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 tick. Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, just like that. Wow. Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Should we move on to the flight deck? Uh, yes, you can. I notice um, you've got the gun racks, the uh, the ammo racks in the uh, in the front here. Yes, well, in the nose. Two 20 millimeter cannon there. Yeah. These are the big ammunition boxes on yes, the side. Yes. And the ammunition chute feeds uh, forward. Yes. We don't have any cannons here. No. No. And down there, that's the low level bomb site. Yes. For use at 300 feet at night. Right. And uh, it's really accurate too. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, the, it takes a lot of training because you always know when you've missed the attack, after it's ha the attack yeah. point, when you of should course. have released, just after it's happened. Yes, and yes. And you, when you're at 300 feet, the old submarine or even the radar boy, if we're using the, this training boy, right. uh, it, it whizzes past underneath you uh, and you've missed the attack point. Of course. That's why we do lots and lots of training. And these look like converters of some sort, are they? Or uh... Uh, oh, don't ask me. It's engineering stuff up okay. down there. The engineer would know. Okay. okay. Um, what do you think these are then? Uh, ashtrays. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've noticed is that they're all over the aircraft. Um, yeah, obviously, yeah. Uh, uh, can you imagine if if the if I mean, probably in those days. Uh, 
at least 30% of the crew would be smokers, wouldn't yeah, it? Well, so this yeah. fills up with smoke, uh, so... Well, uh, actually, I didn't finish talking about in the hot regions. Yeah. Cold regions, we can keep warm with the heaters in the nose. Like yes. The hot regions, where it gets really hot in here, yeah. the pilots will open their little windows. Oh, right, right, there, right yeah. We're, we're flying along at about 100 odd knots, uh, and we'd open those back windows, right. the beam windows, right. just to get a bit of cooling to circulate the air. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Wow. Wow. So, interestingly enough, um, on, the, uh, on the captain's uh, yoke here, we've got a secondary... Um, Not necessarily uh, the captain, the first oh, pilot. Okay, the first pilot, but... Uh, <laughs> But th this is the steering, I believe. No, that's nose wheel steering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for when you're on the ground for taxiing. Yes. So you yeah. press that little button there. Yeah. That activates the uh, the hydraulics down to the nose wheel. Yes. And then it's just a case of steering the aircraft round the taxiway till you get to the runway. Then you line up on the runway, let go of the button. Then yep. you either they cope that lock it or out. The first pilot. They take yep. it in turns yep. to take off and land. And as I was explaining earlier, the white line around here yes. is the, the most important instruments so for night attacks at 300 yep. feet uh, there you are just got to visualize yeah glue yeah, to those. yeah yeah which is just airspeed artificial yeah, horizon, horizon direction and indicators yeah, and so on and so right. forth yeah most yeah important and of course um, the, uh, the 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 red uh, sorry the yellow and black sections uh, are the yeah, emergency fire engine fire extinguishers fire yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You're standing on, by the way, the nose entrance. This right, well, okay, that's the gentleman's entrance, is it? Up. Right. Through here. There's a ladder down there. This, uh, these, these firing buttons on here, N for nuclear? Yeah, N for is nuclear. Is it? Yeah. Wow, wow. Well, so, uh, uh, the pilots do it when we say, tell them to. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, Throttle quadrant on both sides, I notice, which is quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, each, each pilot takes it into action. One pilot's flying it, the other pilot's doing the throttle. Yes. Okay, yes. so if co pilots take off, yep. he does the throttle. Oh, I see. First pilots take oh, off. I see. The co pilots oh, Okay, does the yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. And you need, need need them both sides because in a normal conventional aircraft they're in the middle, of course. Normal, but yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. We need an alleyway to the bomb aimer to get down there. Yes. And the nose lookout and gunner to get down there. Of course, of course. Yeah. Oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> Oxygen. Uh, Hello. This is going to be interesting. If you want a bit on this side here, uh, and including the sonic stuff to finish off, we'll be, still be here. We're coming through here, engines, if we're not careful. No, no, I'm just putting that. Oh, you're just leaving that there, are you? Uh, All right, okay, okay. Put it there for the moment. The engine will find it when it comes. That's okay. Fire. Right, I think we're done, sir. Are we? Okay, then. Well, you've hardly mentioned my side. Oh, okay. Well, I don't no, know. No, I, don't, right. I, I don't know. Well, did, did you use the paint? Did you use the paint as well? No. Somebody, this is this is the engineers dropping things. I don't know where that came from. That's, uh, okay. So this is this is generally your st well, your, your station. The only here. thing I normally point out is this, yep. these are the projectors. One here, one here. They project down onto yes. the table. The a light arrow. Yep, yep. And so here's a typical chart. You'd see an arrow flying along here yes. and so you can guide the aircraft around like that okay so again right. something that the uh, the old bombers used the old navigators um, for the, in the bombers well, used uh, i don't think they had it during the second world war on the lanx uh, they had a, uh, a a projector system that really? came yeah yeah oh, must yeah. have been towards the end of the war i think but uh, um, anyway, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in this aircraft, we certainly did. Now, yes. this seat here is what I call the sleeping seat. Because Sorry. Because flying for 15 and a half are you, hours... Are you coming through yeah, here? Or? Yeah, I'll go that way. Do you want to cut, if you go in there... Okay. Right, okay. Sorry. Yeah, if you're flying for 15 and a half hours, or even 12 and a half hours, you've got to get a bit of sleep. Yes. Okay? Yes. And so, um, on the way up to Norway, uh, top end of Norway, I leave my second nav navigating away like crazy. Yeah. This is where I go... <laughs> Right. Because we've all got to get some sleep. The pilots yeah. take it in turns, one flying it, one having a bit of a doze, yeah. and the other yeah. guys here. Uh, they're going to be busy as lookouts and things like that when we reach our search area in three hours' time. Yes, yes. And in three hours, uh, I would normally, when we get to the top of Norway, I've had a bit of a sleep, so we'd swap over, and then uh, I would... Start uh, plotting. Uh, well, uh, uh, Decide on the kind of search we're going to do, yeah, yeah. Uh, depending on what we're looking for a ship, a submarine, visibility, cloud yes. base. All yes. I talk, talk the pilots, you know, yeah. uh, and, and make decisions on that. My second half can now get a bit of a sleep, right, waiting right. for suddenly we get a radar contact that could be a submarine 
or, or we just see one. Yes. If we're if we're up three, four, five thousand feet, not using our radar, just eyes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See a submarine, and as we're diving down towards it, put the radar on because he's going to see us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, and certainly pick up our radar once we yeah. put that on. But we get a radar fix as, as we're diving down towards it, and so if he goes underwater, then the radar uh, my projectors coming down here. Yeah. Uh, when the submarine goes underwater it always starts here in the centre. Now this is 12 miles here. That thick line there is 10 miles. Right. So if uh, we're guiding it coming in like this, uh, radar passes me a bearing and range and uh, the submarine there, say 0.45 degrees at 10 miles, so we're somewhere on this 10 mile circle. That's north, east, south, west. 0.45 is somewhere up there. So I look round the corner here, and there's, there's some numbers here. There's 045, that direction. That's where we are, 10 miles. I quickly grab these little knobs here and move the aircraft to... I haven't got my glasses with me, where is it? That one there. <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah. And then I guide the aircraft in here. By this stage, there's a clip down here, pull my weapon release out here. I've got sonar boys, 20 sonar boys in the bomb bay yeah. on these switches here. Now, I don't know how technical we want to get here, but I can drop them short cable, 60 feet, or long cable, it's either 150 or 180 feet, I can't right, remember right. now. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, uh, oh, the first son of boy is always a short one, because that's going to be operating quicker yes. than one that has to go all the way down 180 feet, something yes, like that. Yes. So, guiding the aircraft in, and then uh, three miles, bomb doors, I've got a foot switch down here, because both my hands are busy, I've got weapon release here, pencil in this hand, yep. plotting, uh, and uh, so foot switch down here, I can talk to the pilots. Okay. So, three miles, bomb doors open, and uh, now I get power onto my weapon system, I select my first sonobi, I tell these guys the, the channel numbers I'm going to drop, they're, frequent, they're um, uh, VHF uh, numbers which represent frequencies, so yes, channel yes. say, well let's say it's 06, yeah, yeah. and then as my aircraft gets to here, channel uh, 06 now, pencil mark, that's where my aircraft is, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. and I select uh, let's say a long one this time. Yeah. Um, I'm only dropping two here. Normally I would drop four, but yeah. as the aircraft comes across here, channel uh, uh, seven now, pencil mark, and then <laughs> bomb door shut to the pilots. And uh, underneath here, I've got three of these. Okay. Funnily enough, called lighthouses. They're really heavy. Right. And they've got electromagnet thing here to stick into this plate. And I've got two little switches which I can switch the electromagnets off so I can move them around. I've got a, a little lens here that projects vertically upwards a little dot of light and a bearing line. Uh -huh. So now I grab, I've only dropped two solar boys, so I move the little dot of light. This is where the teenage computer generation. <laughs> Why don't you get a computer? <laughs> we didn't have computers. I put the, pen, the little dot of light underneath my pencil mark. Yeah, okay. yeah. Then the other one underneath my pencil mark. So I've got two bearings pointing out like that. Uh -huh. I've got to synchronise my north, which is that way, yeah. with these two guys have got yeah. a, a bearing cursor, they're the Sonics operator. At the bottom they've got a bearing cursor that goes on the left hand side north, east, south, West, okay? right, right, uh, and they so I can calibrate. They don't move those bearings cursors from north. Yes, yes. So now I rotate these round, so my two bearings are now pointing north. Yes, yes. Now I can give them a thumbs up. Right, okay, and uh, everything's set up. They can now send me through information. So the uh, the sonar boy uh, uh, flo floating in the water, aerial po whips up sending signals back to these guys here, yeah. uh, and the underwater microphone, big underwater microphone like this, sinks down uh, either 60 feet, short yeah. cable, yeah. or 100 and, I think it's 180 feet, yeah. long cable, and then it starts turning round, listening for the submarine propeller noise, sort of yeah. that sort of noise, yeah. and then um, these guys will pick it up, there's the noise from the submarine propellers, there's the plastic cursor, so wind, 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 yeah. they wind that over there, they, both do it on my two bearings, like that, pencil, that's where the submarine is, 
And then, as the, where's my aircraft? Here he is, over here on the top of my arm. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. the fires. Come right, attack heading. I know the submarine's roughly north, so I'll give him a rough attack heading, 360. So it's going to take him a while to get round here. Yeah, yeah. As the submarine's moving, these guys are sending me new bearings, so the bearings are changing. I'm plotting fix, fix, fix. I know the submarine's going this way. I've got a six inch rule with 100 yard markings on it. Slide yeah, that yeah. along. Now, down there. Bomb doors, oh, my foot switch. Bomb doors open. This is where I deselect the depth charges. You always yeah. leave them selected to the last minute because you never know when a submarine might make a mistake and pop to the surface. In which case, bomb doors open and they can wallop it with six depth charges. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But now yeah. we're on a running out, so get rid of those. We don't want to drop those. Uh, three torpedoes, select a torpedo, or if we've got NATO permission or right. authority to use nuclear weapons, we're the only ones who can arm the weapons up. Number one weapon, number two weapon. Uh, Whoever's sitting here will be reading out a checklist. The last check for the navigators is select number one weapon. Right. We say. Right. Uh, if we press the release button now, nothing would happen because the, we've got a, an override switch at the first pilot, the senior pilot. I see. Okay. So um, uh, the last check I read out is first pilot bomb release safety lock live. Yes. And is, have we got NATO clearance? Yep. Yes, the second yep. permission, we have to get ships in our local area we're working with. You can't go dropping nuclear weapons around them without getting permission. No, so no. Uh, I get on the radio, whoever's sitting there gets on yep. the radio, yep. gets permission. So, yep, first pilot's quite happy we've got authority. So he goes, bomb release, safety lock, live. The three nuclear weapons are now uh, uh, active and ready to drop. Uh, so my second, uh, if we were using a nuke, would be plotting fixes, guiding the pilots out, Attacking, weapon, it's pressing the foot switch as well, so the pilots here. Weapon, yep. now, and uh, the pilots, when they hear them say, now press their buttons in case yes. our button doesn't work. Yes, uh, yes. And then we just go, full power and... <laughs> Get the hat out of touch. Can. I think um, we've got to go out, Nev, because okay. the uh, because I think um, I've lost my communicate my comms okay. radio, and uh, I'm not sure whether we're still live. <laughs> uh, that's my problem. Um, relying on um, uh, modern technology, I'm afraid. Uh, not. Uh, yeah, you need an allowed hailer. Need a couple of valves yeah. in the back of this thing, don't I? Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, most <laughs> always rings when I'm. Okay. Oh, hello. Okay, okay, okay. We're still, apparently we're still okay. But that's good. Nev, thank you so much for that. So it's very right, detailed and very... You know, uh, I, I can see, I, I enjoy it anyway. Yeah, I no, 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 it's great, job. it's great. In the aircraft, it's wonderful. Outside explaining it is a bit more difficult. Yes, of course, yeah. of course, yeah. Well, no, I absolutely. Photographs which I show people of the inside and the various bits of kit. Yes. Um, but it's not the same as being... No, no, it's nothing like uh, being in the real thing and uh, that's wonderful. Sir, right. thank you very much indeed for your... Uh, All right, well, be careful coming down. Uh, Nev, uh, we've got everybody who's on, on the stream now is just saying uh, we, they want to pass on their thanks to you. All right. Uh, okay. for, your, uh, for your knowledge, and you're an absolute legend, apparently. <laughs> well, Mike, if you had Mike, you'd get a slightly different talk to me. Yeah. But uh, he's been on these shacks as well, same sort of time as me, six years. And Tony, the air engineer. Yeah, yeah. And that we all give slightly different versions. Uh, yes, of course, of course. But, um, yeah, yeah. We're all professionals, you know. Yeah. Uh, you had to be with this aircraft. Of course. And our pilots were very, very good at their job too. Yes. Uh, right. All right. Then. Thank you, sir. Can I grab that little mic off you there? Oh, Just uh, yes. thank you, sir. Okay, do. Oh, we want to know if uh, everybody wants to know if they can adopt you as their granddad. <laughs> <laughs> where are these everybody? He flew the fastest milk cart in the West. Thank where, you, sir. Where are all this team of yours, then? This me. Oh, where, where? No, they're, you're, they're watching you around the world right now. Oh. You're live on YouTube and Facebook, sir. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So you can watch that back later. I don't know if you... Uh, yeah. If you if you watch YouTube or uh, no, Facebook, What's the title of it? Uh, Big Jet TV. Sorry, uh, Big Jet. Here you go. Here's a, that's my. That's, uh, just just when you go online, oh, just have a little look on that. Okay. And uh, 
and uh, you'll be able to see your entire piece back later, sir. Right. Your name was? Jerry. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Right. Cheers, Nev. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. There you go, folks. The, uh, the Avro Shackleton. Oh, sorry. Hold on, Jilly. You'll get a little bit of a pop there. So what are these guys doing? They're just, uh, this is the uh, air start system, isn't it? They just uh, fired up the ground power unit. What are you doing here then, Dave? Charging up the uh, pneumatic system. I see. Uh, so we just do a pre-charge on it, so um, the pneumatics will control the rad flaps. I see, I see. Okay, and that's all air, is it? I see. So you still use the radiator flaps and everything, just for... It needs needs to have, um, basically, they're in the ideal condition that they should be now for ground running. Right. So fully open, so you're getting maximum airflow. I see, there. I see. Um, but obviously, with the crop wash, if we didn't have any pressure in there, they'd eventually bring them closed and restrict the airflow through there, which for ground running I is see. ideal. I see. Yeah, uh, Nev's just taking us around the whole aircraft and it's uh, very knowledgeable. <laughs> knows his stuff, man, knows his stuff. Well, obviously, he flew on them. But I, uh, did you ever. He's going to do volume two this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> volume two. Um, <laughs> did, did, did you ever, uh, did you ever uh, think about running these, uh, the, 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 uh, the Vipers on these at all? We've got them, but they're not installed. Right, right. So, uh, really, for. It would be nice to one day fit them yeah. while, while they're outside. Yes. It's, it adds extra weight on, onto the wing and yes, of course. another thing to do. Plus yeah, yeah. The Vipers, they run, they, well, they're a jet engine, should run on jet fuel, yes. but they didn't put an additional fuel system into the Shackleton when they installed them, so they run on Avgas. Yeah, yeah. As a fact that they'll only run for about, I think it's about 60 hours before they're then pulled and they have to, because yeah, basically yeah. they're running hotter than they would do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he mentioned that the, the later variants had these uh, switches um, of different stages that so they could, because... Um, the original ones there'll were either... Be a burst I... of air soon, so Sorry? There'll be a burst of air in it. Oh, is it? Oh, OK, OK. Discharge it. Is it coming out of there, is it? It comes out from, from the bay, but it's, it's okay. the noise. The OK, so I, I need to be ready for it. Thanks for the warning, mate. <laughs> it always Nearly... catches us out. We always try to remember which pressure it is at. Right, is it really loud? Should I... Oh, you won't... Is that... Yeah. Right. OK, OK. Yeah. Sounds like a big jet going out, sounds like a Dreamliner. Or is it a triple even? It's not BA triple, is it? What's going out of Gatwick right now, Jerry? Yeah, that's BA triple, but it is a BA triple, wow. That's good to hear, going out of Gatwick. We like that. Okay, 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 okay. She's daddy long legs on him, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a good feel for the pilots,
is uh, is the Lincoln, ladies and gents. I think the uh, tail section is uh, still derived from the uh, from the Lincoln. I don't think it's uh, changed that much from to Lincoln like. How far are we off, Milton? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, yeah? Good stuff, good stuff. Nice. So, let's have a little look at this, folks, because um, we've seen the, uh, we've seen the, um, these pieces here, all titanium, of course, as the, uh, and they're on those runners there, as you can see there. Uh, and this is what squeezes the air, basically. You look right down inside there. Wow, it's just crazy, isn't it? The business end of a English electric lightning. So they're the reheats. That's for the reheat, um, which basically squeezes the air to maximise the amount of uh, pressure that the engine needs to 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 go into reheat. I'm sure there's uh, a more technical correct term or way of describing it but uh, those are the nozzles which uh, RAF um, Mike from RAF Marham works on the uh, the F35 and this particular um, part of the engine is one of the most complex pieces because everything you see here has to work in unison uh, if one particular piece is slightly out of sync um, then of course the, 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 the nozzle will not squeeze um, as it should. But uh, it's quite interesting to see that the upper nozzles are slightly more closed than the, uh, than the lower one. But uh, talk to somebody about that maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Hey Milton, just noticing the uh, the the nozzle assembly on the uh, yeah. on the on the upper engine is slightly more squeezed than the uh, than the lower one. Yeah. I mean, obviously you're not you're not using them, but uh, no, what, well, but that's just for reheat, do, isn't it? Just automatically. Oh, what do they? Happens, yeah. When you when we start one engine and the air system gets online, yeah, they'll they'll both find their neutral positions. Oh, really? So they're still they're still active then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're active regardless of whether you're um, banging it into reheat or not. Yeah, um, yeah. Once you get above, I think it's about 83% and they adjust automatically. So. Right. Um, yeah. Do they make a little squealy noise like the uh, F16, F15s? And... No, not, no, not really. Not really. Sometimes they can be a bit lazy. We ran number one last week. Yeah. Um, because when we brought it back down to idle at about low idle at about 40 percent for a while the air the air supply drops off quite quickly and it, i see they, they sort of ended up in the position they are oh i but see you'll, you'll probably see from the videos after the run next time that once we've started it you'll see them both just go to neutral where they should be fairly quickly right right yeah good good okay just as a just as an update gp has barbarella left yet just Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. And who's that information from? Oh, is it? Okay, that's interesting. And what day are we talking about there? Is that Monday? Thursday? Perfect. Okay, that's good. Scott, this way. This is Bob. Bob, He's also involved. So all the... Uh, Oh, 
Who's in the seat for the first one then, Dave? Uh, I'd probably let Milt have a go this, this one. Nice, nice. Okay, right, well, so, big question is, do we film this off the, off the truck, or do we film it from down here? Can't help but think I want to film it from down here. What I do need to do is... Uh, in the way there. It's not aged, is it? There's a lot of people over this way. There's no speakers over this way, though. That's quite a nice angle from here. Just have a look and see what it's uh, what's what it's going to be like. From hello, Peter. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm well, sir. Thank you. Good. Just trying to sort of like figure out my angle in terms of where I'm going to yeah. film it from. Whether I'm going to be over there or whether I'm going to be on top of the van. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Cheers. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Like. Yeah. The other one would be the best one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now, the question is, lots of people here, folks. Okay. A little old van over there, look. He's still on his own, look. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello, mate. The van's got wings. Jet TV gives you wings. <laughs> no? Chris Evans, flipping out, what's he doing on here? <laughs> no, 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 no. Mm. A big Jet TV what? Oh my goodness me, no. No, really? <laughs> well, that's uh, <laughs> that's some going, isn't it? Wow, fair play. Okay, right. Let's have a little look and see what this uh, what this looks like from this position, folks. Just stand by. I just need to get this on here. Uh, Just at the start, just need to tighten it up. Okay, that's that. Uh, I need to just make a slight adjustment here. here is the backdrop is absolutely there's a problem there big old load of horrible no I don't like that I don't like that too. still like it oh, that was... okay, so that's coming that's coming <laughs> So that's the back in here. Okay, that's the back in here. Let me see if I can get this back on here because uh, the Shackleton will be fine. We'll film the Shackleton from this uh, from this position, but uh, not the lightning. Not the net. All that horrible hardware behind it's going to look crap on any sort of videos that go out. 
post production days. Okay. So it's covered up there, which is a good thing because it's just uh, started raining again. Right, okay. Okay, we're gonna uh, abort that mission. About five, ten minutes away, folks, from the uh, from ignition. Chat on you got the time I worked on her and saw her coming brand new in Saudi Arabia. In oh, did you? You worked on them in Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Must be great for you to watch this then. Yeah, yeah. and I've got the, we've got the next one down from her at Tangmere. Is it? <coughs> 670. Mm. Wow. Now it's isn't it? And I saw them go off armed up and come back empty. Wow. And come as Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> 1969. Wow. Yeah. Most of the days. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, now, the big question is, uh, do I switch to the proprietary mic on the camera? Uh, there's Peter. He's not there. Runway operations in the last. Uh... Right, Jilly, I'm just going to check mics here. Jilly? Okay. Um, I'm going to go to uh, camera mic, just stand by. What's that? What's wow? Oh. Right, okay. Right, I've just, uh, I've just uh, disconnected the. Uh... I've just disconnected the Lavellia mic uh, to the to the camera mic. Okay, can you just uh, let me know? Are you picking these guys up? Okay, Jilly, can you confirm? Okay, what's it like now? Okay, okay. Right. Okay, now just tell me whether you uh, whether you pick that up. No, just let me put the Lavellia on and see whether you pick up pick it up on the Lavellia. Stand by. I'm going to the Lavellia now. Two, three. Yeah, I'm just looking for ambient. I'm not looking for my audio. I'm looking for. I'm looking for amb These guys. I'm wondering if you if you're picking them up. Okay. 
Okay, okay. And just tell me if it's clearer. I'm just going to take the Lavellia out and use the go to the proprietary mic. Ready? Here we go. No difference. <laughs> off, off. Yeah, that's the camera mic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Going to do that. Going to do that. What's that? Say that again. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all good. So this is obviously the uh, fire marshals meeting just to make sure that everything's in place. Blimey. It's got a bit of 319 in it, or 320 going out. Is Utrid, son of Utrid. <laughs> he needs uh, he needs one of those little things around his beard, doesn't he? And a massive sword. They just need to be horns coming out the side of his head, don't they? What's the time, GP? What's the time? Okay, 15 minutes. 10 past this, eh? <laughs> Aren't they going to have all, all, all have a big huddle, like, in the football? Do fist pumps. Just so I can record it. <laughs> 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 
This one is actually through here. Yeah, yeah. That one is down the bottom. It's actually a bit more restrictive. Um, so you can get your one sorted out. So you're alright with that one, aren't you? Last time we did it on that pin as well. Because they brought it over there. Just as it starts to spit. So, uh, just um, just above their heads, there, folks. You see a little outlet where there is a just there. That's uh, part of the starter system where they'll, uh, they'll have to actually extinguish a flame. There'll be a little flame that will come out of there, apparently. What's that, GP? What's stopped? Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. stuff in the background but here I've got bodies Thank you. 
What a shame.
was that? People like it? People enjoyed it, yeah? Used to be one of my favourite uh, favourite aircraft at, at the air shows back in the day, and he was using probably about 10% power there, just over idle. You know, I mean, uh, taxiing, taxi power. I reckon that was <laughs> probably. Back, Nicely done, right? sir. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. What was the uh, what was the little tech issue, Ed? Very oh. easy, very well sorted out by Dave, by the looks of it. There's two ignition modules at the top. And we had the plugs back to front, so it was a 30 second fix. Oh, I bet we should have. Yeah. Well, we thought that's a bit weird because you never get both engines fail to start at once. Right, so right. That's when we on the radio we said, go and you know, let's check the plugs. Fair play. Something so obvious. Fair play. So simple, isn't it? Yeah, but it actually ran really well. Yeah, it was great. Smooth, it was no great. problems. Great uh, demonstration. Yeah. Loud, Looked, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> what, what what sort of percentage are you running on there in terms of like you know, we is it up. just above? of taxi speed or oh, no a lot higher than that oh is it okay yeah, we, we took her up to just under 90 percent wow really yeah yeah oh, you, you wow. probably noticed at high power that all the puddles are shimmering right 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 i didn't but uh, on my little monitor it probably picked it up but yeah. wow up to 90 percent eh? it was fantastic percent we don't wow. want to push it too far because the only reason we haven't run it in reheat not yeah. that it won't run it will, it'll go into reheat but we yeah. just don't want to do it on this concrete at some no. point next year we're going to get all this redone the concrete okay. hopefully yeah. Yeah, and then we've got some special chocks that go down two feet. I see. Concrete. Right, so you can yeah. really I mean, strap her down. She's hydraulically braked, and we've got the chocks in. Yeah, it's unlikely yeah. that it will jump a chock, but yeah, yeah. But um, you just can't be too. No, short, so we it? don't. You know, we don't tend to take it above 88, 90. Right, max. right. Good though, 90 um, percent. That's really good. Yeah, it's got some power. That's yeah, for sure. yeah, for sure, for sure. Nicely done. So you'll be doing another one uh, later on the today then. Yes, not on the Lightning though. That's it okay. for the Lightning today. Um, yeah. So the Shackleton, how long till you run the Shackleton, do you think? So we've stated three o'clock for the Shack. Is it? Okay, yeah. okay. Um, hopefully we won't have any problems with the Shack. She can be a bit more finicky. The Lightning's... Right. As you say, we were surprised, but it started properly in the end. Yeah, yeah. The Lightning can be a bit... F uh, the Shackleton can be a little bit finicky, especially when it's damp, but we'll see how we right. go. Okay, give it a go. Thanks, mate. No problem. Good stuff. Okay, well, um, folks, what do you want to do then? Do you want to go off and grab some lunch? And we'll, uh, and we'll, uh, oh, <laughs> we'll uh, go off and grab some lunch and um, we'll come back uh, around about uh, half past two um, to, uh, to fire up ye oldy Shackleton. Well, it's not that old, actually, but 1966 he flew in that, so not in that one, but flew in, um, flew on the Shackletons, so uh, still quite old. Well, I was born in 63, so uh, it's over 50 years ago, all right? Um, but anyway, um, yeah, hope you enjoyed that. That was great. At 90%, eh? 90%? Didn't realise that. But um, yeah, we'll see you back here around about half past two. Don't go too far away. Just about enough time to take the dog for a walk or nip down the boozer for a quick swift arf. Uh, we'll see you later, folks. Take it easy. Bye. Thank you, Chief. You're just trying to blind us. Son of a bitch.